Let's see here. We are now unmuted. Sorry about that. Chris Johnson from uh, Living Waters Fly Fishing in Round Rock, Texas, and Umqua Signature Tire. Uh, very, very excited to be on board with you guys tonight. And uh, we're going to go over streamers in, uh, in detail. So it should be a lot of fun. And uh, we've got a really awesome fly deck lined up tonight. Very, very excited to uh, hear a bunch of uh, questions from folks that want to know more about streamer fishing in general or the different patterns that we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, but we'll go through a lot of stuff. But let's go ahead and get some of the... Uh, some of the stuff out of the way. Uh, we are going to um, basically have all sorts of different streamer patterns. We'll have stuff that's more leech-like, stuff that's more bait fish-like. Uh, we've got a sculpin in there. We've got all kinds of goodies. Uh, but tonight, do want to thank Trout Unlimited for supporting this broadcast. And uh, we're very dear friends. Uh, they're very dear friends of ours, rather, uh, here at Living Waters. Uh, we're a gold level TU business, and we do a lot of work uh, with Trout Unlimited, both on the local level here in Texas uh, shout out to Guadalupe River Trout Unlimited, our local chapter. Uh, we have, I think it's somewhere around 5,800 members, uh, which I know that shocks a lot of you viewing from trout country. Um, but yeah, we, that's right. We have all of one trout fishery in Texas. It's, uh, it, there's just one. Uh, so, it, so I understand that's a bit of a surprise, but, uh, we love TU. We really appreciate all they do for conservation and, uh, for the industry as well. So shout out to TU. Thank you so much for, uh, supporting this broadcast. Um, obviously, if you are on YouTube tonight, uh, make sure you like, subscribe. Uh, they were telling me there's like a little bell or something you got to click. I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm never on YouTube, so I, I apologize. I'm very, uh, I'll say technologically impaired when it comes to anything YouTube related. So um, when it comes to that, just do all the things. Y'all probably know what to do if you're watching on there. You, you got it figured out by now. So like, subscribe. Uh, you know, comment if you have questions, anything like that. And uh, also make sure that uh, you, you click that bell. I, once again, I don't know what that is. So I'm, I'm not a YouTube person. But anyway, uh, if you would like to uh, follow any of the tires tonight, a lot of them can be found on uh, Instagram, Facebook, different uh, social media outlets, myself included, if you want to follow Living Waters. Uh, you know, it's just Living Waters Fly Fishing on Instagram. You can find it on Facebook as well. Um, so actually broadcasting from the fly shop tonight. It's a little bit quieter when the uh, floor is not bustling downstairs, so we shouldn't hear any uh, people yelling and telling fish stories and things like that outside the office door. So that'll help tonight. Uh, I know streamers is tonight, but we'll also have um, Steelhead up next on the UMQA broadcast. So we're going to have that one going uh, following uh, this one. This will be the next, I think it's the next presentation. I believe it's uh, following week from now. So Nonetheless, we will have that uh, have that coming up to you pretty quick. Let's talk a little bit about streamers before we actually jump into the tying side of it. So we've got four different patterns on the deck tonight. Uh, we've got guest tires of Brandon Mina. We've got Charlie Craven, John Bond, and myself, Chris Johnson. Uh, we will have uh, a full streamer deck for you tonight. So first off, obviously, this is not dainty dry fly fishing. This is not. Uh, this isn't. You know super long cast and pillow soft presentations and reach mins and all that sort of stuff. This is kind of down and dirty. This is, uh, th this is something that I think everybody really wants a little bit of this in their life. I really honestly do. I think that everybody wants to use a little bit bigger leader and tippet. Everybody wants to grab a slightly bigger rod. They want to throw a streamer. Now, if you're a dry fly purist and you know, if it doesn't have a hackle, I mean, Obviously, I've got a feather problem. Y'all can see that. So I'm, I'm no stranger to dry fly hackle. I, I love a good dry fly as much as anybody. But if that's all you do, and you've never set the hook on a really ticked off streamer eating fish, I'm sorry, there's a whole other side of fly fishing you're missing out on. So the, the trout game is good. You get a good brown trout coming up and slicing a streamer in two, that's good times. If you're doing the bass thing, and that's obviously where I'm from, from Central Texas. So you know, like I said, we have the one trout fishery, but literally everything around me, I've got 90 seconds that way. I've got uh, Brushy Creek right here in downtown Round Rock, and it's full of our state fish, which is the Guadalupe bass. And if that thing wants to eat your streamer, there is nothing you can do to get it away from them. They're just absolutely going to crush it. And the thing that's so fantastic about it is when a bass or a big trout grabs a streamer and you've got the tippet to support it, you cross his eyes. You let him know who's boss. And in bass and heavy cover, that literally, it's a, it's a eat so hard, it kind of makes your pancreas hurt. You know, it's, it's something on your insides kind of aches a little bit when they hit it that hard. That's, that's what it's all about. And you let them know who's boss right out the gate. It's not this dainty little trout set. I, I know many other Umqua Signature tires and have fished with a few of them. 
I could tell and rat out a few stories uh, on some of the guys from Trout Country. Uh, I'm not going to name any names, Pat Dorsey. Um, but nonetheless, uh, Pat Dorsey, I I've taken him bass fishing a number of times, breaking a master tailwater angler of his trout set. It's a very difficult thing. Now, I'm proud to say he started taking trips down south to South America in the jungle. Uh, good friend Michael Williams down there. He's uh, teaching him how to fish for peacock bass. So, so Pat, I think, is coming along on the bass set. So I know he loves a good streamer game, too. Uh, but tonight, we want to make sure that we get uh, all the time in the world to answer your questions. And uh, if anybody has any anything uh, that you want to ask regarding any of the patterns or just streamer fishing in general, uh, we're going to cover all of that. We'll talk about lines tonight. Uh, you know, we, it's really interesting. I talked to all the tires uh, via email and some on the phone before we uh, did this tonight. And they all have their own preferences. Some of them really like fishing floating lines and pounding the banks. Some of them like waiting with a floating line. Uh, I myself, I'm a huge fan of full sink lines. And I know, I think I'm like the exception to the deck tonight. Uh, I think everybody else is like, yeah, sink tips at the most. I'm a full sink guy. I mean, I, I want to get it down there and go, go, go knock on some noses. Um, I've got a very good friend, uh, kind of the godfather of Central Texas fly fishing, Joe Robinson. Uh, he, he has a quote, says, most fly fishermen would rather eat dirt than cast a full sink line. And uh, thankfully, modern, modern technology and sinking lines has changed that quite a bit. So we'll talk a little bit about lines. Uh, but before we launch into the first pattern, it's actually my own. So uh, we're going to talk about the creek leech a little bit. And it's obviously near and dear to my heart. I mean, you love your own kids, right? Um, let's see. Somebody's asking if I'm working a mustache. I promise you it's the lighting. There is nothing nothing there. I, I am clean shaven. It is the lighting. So uh, no, there is not a mustache. It, it, uh, to be honest, there are very few people in this world that I know that can pull off solely a mustache. Um, if I'm in Alaska or Colorado, I'll let the, the trout scruff or the backcountry scruff go a little bit, but the, the mustache ain't going to happen. That, 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 that look is not going to work on me at all. So the lighting, if it, if it works out and it looks like one, if that, if that looks good to y'all, then, uh, you know, maybe I'll give it a shot, but I'm, I'm not I'll put it this way. I still want to kiss my wife when I go home, and I don't think she'd like that. So a little, little fuzzy up there ain't great. All right. Well, the main thing tonight when we talk about the creek leech, uh, all right, man, sorry sorry to interrupt. John Bond is on in Norway. Man, uh, John, I am so sorry about the time difference. You are you are aching right now for whatever's going on. So hopefully you're, uh, you're not sleep depriving yourself too much. But uh, thanks for having a fly on deck tonight. Um, but the creek leech, to jump back in before we uh, forward, go into tying it and all the instructionals, the reason behind the fly primarily is I needed a creature bait for bass. And I know that I kind of uh, kind of destroyed the whole leech thing and added legs to it. So, I mean, you know, bass fishing, if it's got a bunch of legs, they're going to eat it. The thing that's really fantastic about the creek leech is that these legs, and, I, and, and I'll mention it in the tying process, but the legs are actually a material that's very seldom known in the fly tying world. It's called perfect rubber. Most people, when they tie streamers, they're going to tie it with silly legs or something like that, and, and they sink. I don't know if y'all have ever looked at a uh, fly in water before. Uh, once you wet it down, I mean, you can swim tank them all day long, but uh, the creek leech, I'll actually crawl it across the bottom when I'm sight fishing. The best thing about it is that the perfect rubber legs are made out of a, a, a type of material that actually floats when you get it wet uh, or it's under the water. And so you got a bass staring your streamer down and there's just legs and rabbit zonker all in his face and he cannot stand that. They don't like that very much. I mean, it's it's like the fly sitting there going, and he wants him to, I mean, it's just like it's asking for it. I mean, I love that. And so I take a lot of my bass flies and integrate anything that's gonna be streamer or you know on the bottom, you know, fished, fished along the bottom. I'll use that perfect rubber leg so that there's a buoyancy to the leg if you have not tried those out, uh, go to your local fly shop, wherever that may be, uh, and by all means, ask for that stuff. It's, they probably don't carry it. A lot of them don't carry it, but if they don't, I promise you, if they carry hairline dubbing products or Hedron Flashaboo, they can get it. Um, so if you've got a good fly shop and they don't mind special ordering some materials for you, that is a number one in a lot of my streamer tying is a leg that actually floats versus sinks. Um, if you're trying to get the fly a little deeper, I can understand the use of silly legs. Uh, but man, if I've got a bass staring a fly down and you've got a leg there hovering in its face, they do not like that. So obviously I am from bass country. So the designs on these flies are a little bit different. Uh, I've caught trout on the creek leech. I've caught carp on the creek leech. I've caught bass on the creek leech. Everything eats it. 
Um, and it comes in uh, a myriad of sizes. I've tied it much larger than Uncle carries it for uh, large bass scenarios down here in Texas. And then you can also fish it all the way down to like a 10. If you want to sub the rabbit for squirrel, you can go a little bit smaller. Um, but by and large, that four to eight window in the hook size is really, uh, I think, some of my favorites uh, for the Hill Country of Texas and beyond. So uh, we'll kind of talk about uh, all, all the questions and answers you have that, that we need to give after the fly. And uh, we can go ahead and get started with the creek leech and uh, we'll go into some of the tying process. All right, folks, we're going to go ahead and get started tying the creek leech. This is one of my all-time favorite patterns for just bass in general, whether it's Guadalupe bass like we have in the Texas Hill Country, largemouth, smallmouth across the country, wherever. Uh, this fly really does get it done, and uh, it's just a good all-purpose kind of a creature pattern, if you will. I know it's called the creek leech. Uh, it can imitate, obviously, larger leeches, but, you know, leeches don't have legs. So this thing does, but uh, I'll go ahead and show you how to get started. This is a Gamakatsu B10S. We're just going to take some olive thread, lay down a small thread base at the front of the hook here, trim this up. I use the uh, double pupil eyes that uh, are made available by Hairline and uh, normally just make a few wraps just to get the thing secured to where it isn't going to fall off. And uh, if they spin on you, no big deal. You're going to come over the other way anyway. So what we're going to do here, we want to make sure they're far enough back to where we have time or uh, room rather to tie off the rabbit. So I normally do this where I wrap a bunch of different, a uh, bunch of different wraps going each direction here. Do like so, fill that up just a little bit, make sure it's nice and secure. Make sure some of those wraps are very, very tight towards the end. And then all you have to do simply is make a few what's called frapping wraps right there to make sure that that pulls all that together. Once that's there, you should have those eyes up towards the front of the hook, uh, j just in front of halfway point. So I kind of like them at the, the very back of the first third, if that makes any sense. We are going to use a material that is very seldom known in the fly tying world, and that is perfect rubber. Perfect rubber is basically a leg material that floats, and it's not commonly used um, I'm actually aware of this because I used to tournament bass fish and uh, there were a lot of different baits that used this material. It is made available by Hedron Flashaboo. Um, and so this material, all I'm doing is I'm taking one of those legs and doubling it over and I'm just tying it down the center to where when I get to the end here, it splits out the back in more or less a V and then I'm wrapping all that material down. The reason I'm doing this is I'm about to dub over all of that. And so that helps give me just a little bit more body underneath there, but that also makes sure the leg is nice and secure. So get that how you want it. Make sure that V split looks look about like that is what we're after. Something that has a little V split out the back. This leg material actually floats. And so the nice thing about it is when you're using it, if a bass decides to stare down the fly, uh, this stuff sticks up right in his face and moves the entire time. It's become a staple on most of my subsurface bass patterns. We're going to use, uh, this is Whitlock's SLF dubbing right here in the Helgramite color. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're actually going to spin a dubbing loop. But I am, uh, I'm more of a split thread type person. So as opposed to making a loop off the fly, I'm going to go ahead and take a needle, split this thread. And uh, that can be a little harder depending on what kind of thread you're using. This is 10 aught vivas here, so probably a little small for your standard bass fly, but hey, it was olive and it was the first thing I grabbed. So we're gonna just simply take that, insert the dubbing into the dubbing loop here. And you can be pretty generous with it, it's okay. I'm not worried about that. We're gonna insert that into the loop. Once it's in there, we're gonna simply spread that dubbing out just a little bit. You're going to spin the bobbin, so you just simply, it's the same technique that uh, Mark Pettyjohn uses for all of his CDC stuff. We're just simply doing it with dubbing instead of CDC. Make a few twists. You simply move those up in there. I know that probably doesn't show on camera too well, uh, but you simply move those twists up. Hold your legs in position where you want them, and you're simply going to move up the hook with that dubbing, just one bunch right in front of the other. Finish all that stuff off right there behind. There we go. Get all that junk out of there. Right there behind the eyes. Just like so. 
All right, just got a little fluffy dubbed body to make up the rear of the hook there. We are going to tie in two bunches of legs on each side. So we're going to take a perfect rubber leg. This is that motor oil color that we just used for the legs that are out the rear of the fly. And then there's a second color. It's just simply called brown. Um, it has a little bit of a sheen to it. It's kind of a neat color when you get it up in uh, some good lighting. Um, and I, I know that people tie their legs in a bunch of different ways. But for me, this I like actually taking these little loops and making loops with the legs. We're going to tie basically four legs out each side. So it's one leg doubled on each side. The reason I like doing those loops is it allows you to position the leg exactly where I want it on the side, kind of not quite perfectly on the side, but just slightly offset underneath the fly. Simply take that tight and nice and tight. You come in there and get a real nice trim and those loops are easy to trim and it allows you to tuck those legs up underneath there as opposed to wrapping it. Uh, I know you can obviously uh, take these and put them on the thread, them, uh, the thread itself and pull them in. I prefer the loop method just because it really does allow me to take this, manually move the legs where I want it, pull them in tight, and the legs should be situated primarily on the side and bottom of the hook. Once you've done that, you simply come in there, trim the loops as tight as you can. And this thing looks like a hairy mess right now. We're going to come in here and trim all this stuff a little shorter. We'll trim that a lot shorter in a minute, but just for now, let's get that out of the way and nice and clean. So they're on the, basically the sides and bottom of the hook is what we're after there. For the final portion of the dubbing bit, we are going to actually take a little bit more of that Helgramite dubbing, and we're going to just make a little dubbing noodle here. So you're simply, that's a little too much there. You don't want to do too much. What the rule of dubbing is take what you need, cut it in half, cut it in half again, and you're probably right about where you need to be. It's a lot better to have to add more than have to take it away. Kind of like in deer hair tying where you wind up, uh, you can cut it away, but then you can never put it back. So we're just simply tying over all that where we tied those legs in to kind of cover our tracks a little bit. I want just a little bit more on there to kind of fill up that gap in the eyes that does a number of things. One, it covers your tracks. Second of all, it actually allows you to uh, have a little bit softer water entry here when you do this. So we're kind of doing those little figure eight wraps to fill all that up. And that's exactly what we want. I normally kind of stroke that back. It should look something like that where you've got it all nice and clean right through there. Get in front, give a couple of wraps to reposition, and simply flip your fly over. Now, if you want, you can kind of brush some of this out. I've got a little, got a little thread on that one. Just kind of take this, brush this guy out, make him a little fluffier under here. Uh, one of the things that's kind of nice about a dubbing brush that's round like that is you can actually roll it. And I know it's a little hard to see on camera, but you can basically just roll it in the hook gap, and it brushes all the stuff all the way to the tail end of the hook there. It gets this thing looking a little fluffier, which is always nice. We are going to take two feathers off of a whiting soft hackle chickaboo. This is a very unique material. Uh, it looks a lot like marabou at first glance, but this is actually uh, a soft hackle chickaboo patch uh, from whiting that's a natural grizzly already. So it's, I believe, the only naturally available grizzly marabou like this that's going to have this sort of length to it. Uh, you can find a lot of, you know, chickaboos that are going to be much, much shorter, but this stuff is very, very long. This isn't even the longest stuff on the pelt. This is actually some of the mid-length stuff. All I'm going to do, it's probably going to be twice the hook length here. If you see kind of where I'm at, uh, this is going to be twice the hook length. And you want to tie in two feathers, come over the top, grab those, tie those in nice and firm, position them right on top of the hook, come in with your scissors and trim that as tight as you possibly can without cutting your thread. Take that, tie all your fuzzies down. If you got any fuzzy up front, just get rid of it. We're gonna make a nice little thread hair or thread head there in just a minute. Get rid of this stuff. And the final step is to tie on our rabbit. So we wanna make sure that this stuff is positioned well where it kind of flares all the way over the hook so it pokes out the sides. The goal of this, and the reason we use two feathers, is one kind of favors one side, one favors the other. That way when we put the rabbit on, it splays that out each side. Now here we have Hairline's Frost Tip Rabbit Strips in a uh, Frost Tip Olive. Um, if you're looking for an item code, it's FRS3. Uh, if you're looking for a Hairline item code, 
we're simply going to prep that by cutting our rabbit to where we got a kind of a smooth spot to tie in right here, making sure it's right on top of the hook. Tie that in nice and firm. Working your way back. Get that how you want it. I'm going to come in here and trim that as close as I can get it. Cutting through that leather is a little hard. This is where sharp scissors are handy. And I'm not entirely sure that these are all that sharp, but that'll work. And once you've trimmed that about where you're about where you're happy with it, we're going to simply make a little thread head here and we're going to kind of build that up. You notice that there's a little bit of a jump there coming down. That's okay. I'm going to build up a little bit of a thread head. And then we're going to coat this with some UV cure at the very end. Uh, if you're using a larger thread like an ADOT, it doesn't take very long to build this head up at all. This is actually a little bit fine. This thread is for this fly. If you got any dubbing fuzzes or anything like that hanging in there, you can always cut those off. Clean up the front of your fly. That's not an issue. And all you're going to do is just finish that wrap. Kind of make sure you get that step down the way you want it. To where there's not that bump from where we tied in the rabbit. And you're trying to get a little bit smoother transition. And then once you've got that, come in here. Don't magnetize a razor blade on your bench there. Throw a couple of whip finishes right there at the very end of the fly. And you got enough thread head to work with. Come in there, simply trim this as close as you can. And uh, I've got some Gulf Thin right here. We're going to apply that very, very easily. Just take a little bit. doesn't take much. I'm not really wanting this major, major big head. I just really want to coat those thread wraps here. Make sure that's nice and even on the outside. Trying to keep it off your hair if at all possible. Nice thing about these needles is you've, you'll just kind of tease that stuff back to where it covers all of your thread wraps. You should be in good shape. That should be good right there. Apply a little bit to the underside of the fly as well. And that's it. There's a lot of folks that have forgotten the good old days of epoxy where you had to uh, mix all that stuff up and you were applying it with toothpicks and all that sort of good stuff. This has made life so much easier. Just squeeze it right out the bottle, hit it with that UV light, rotate the fly around. And that's it. All right, for the final trim job here, before we finally complete the fly, we want to come in here. Uh, first things first, I'm going to choose my legs here. So the back legs, I'm going to pull aside. Come in here with this, uh, with your scissors, and trim the legs below pretty short. They're not going to be all that long. You want them probably, um, just as a general reference, no longer than the marabou. That way they kind of sit on the bottom and they prop this fly up as it crawls along. And then final step here is what we're going to do with the rabbit. We're going to take our finger, watch your hook obviously, you want to punch it through, punch the hook through the rabbit there. You're going to have to actually take the hook out of the vise, punch it through. Once you've done that, you can reinsert it. We're going to flip the fly upside down and trim the rabbit fairly short. Still going to be longer than the marabou, but overall length, you want it probably about two and a half times. I mean, we're going to go a little bit shorter than that. About two and a half times the hook shank. And then take your tail, or excuse me, the legs that are out the tail there, trim those to where they're just ever slightly longer than the rabbit. And that right there is a finished creek leech. So you can see the legs. If this were sitting on the bottom, those legs would splay out the side. These legs would come out the back. That is exactly what we're wanting, where this actually props up, and uh, this fly will actually lift up off the bottom a little bit, and those legs out the back are just dangling in the fish's face. These are still moving around nice and neat. Uh, just a very, very effective bass fly. Not difficult to tie at all, and uh, I think it'll do work for you wherever you decide to bass fish. So I hope you enjoy it. All right. Hope everybody learned a little something there, uh, like how not to poke your finger with a hook when you jam a rabbit zonker through it. So we had a lot of questions come in. Uh, I've got a, a, a whole slew of notes here um, about streamer fishing in general, and even some stuff that directly pertain to the fly. Uh, cold water and low water streaming, uh, streamer fishing, I got some questions about. Cold water streamer fishing, and you have to look at cold as relative, depending on where you're going. Um, you know, for Texas, 
you know, cold. It's cold outside right now for us. Yesterday, I honestly could have broke a sweat walking around the block here at the fly shop. Today, it is freezing cold, literally, like sleeting and stuff like that. So Texas can go through, you know, temperature swings, 50, 60 degrees in a day. And the water is still warm-ish. You know, it's one of those things that we had a very warm winter down here. Um, but for our conditions, you know, that really more of the pressure and weather change is what really causes fish to get a little bit more sluggish. When the water temp uh, cools over an extended period of time, that's when we have a little bit more difficulty. Uh, so for me, uh, cold, cold water first, if I were to address it, I'm going to put a heavier sinking line on. I want that fly as deep in the water column as I can get it. Um, if I'm having to prospect for fish, if I'm working water, that's not extraordinarily deep and I am actually going to be able to pause and rest the fly, like in a bass situation or a carp situation, I may still be able to use a floating line or maybe even just a sink tip. Uh, but a lot of times I'll use, uh, with a floating line, I'll use a longer leader, uh, to where I'm able to get the fly down a little bit deeper and keep it there. Uh, but those are some of the things that I would do in cold water is focus on getting the fly deeper if at all possible, and then slowing down my retrieve. Uh, a lot of times, especially in the bass world, uh, metabolism slow. Uh, as, the, as the water temp drops, their metabolism slows. They don't eat as much. And so I'm really wanting to make sure that I keep the fly where it needs to be for as long as I can keep it there uh, to kind of sell it to the fish. In a trout arena, you know, trout are cold water critters. They, I mean, obviously, in the coldest of cold, you'll see you know, wintering lies and things like that, where these fish will drop into deeper water and it's a little slower. Uh, once again, I'm trying to get this fly down in the column as much as I can, stay in front of those fish, and I'll experiment with retrieves. Um, you know, sometimes they don't want you to sell it, sometimes they want you to provoke them. Um, we got a name here of how did the name for the creek leech come about? Um, basically, it's not all that original. I fish it in a creek a lot and it kind of looks like a leech. I mean, I wish I had a really good story, but I don't. Um, naming flies, honestly, is the hardest thing for me. Um, if we were to look up somebody who's really good at fly names, it'd be like Charlie Craven or somebody like that. You know, the, I mean, we're doing his swim coach tonight. The story behind that is fantastic. But, you know, the creek leech, it's like, eh, <laughs> it's a leech. And I fish it in Brushy Creek a lot. You know, it's just, it's kind of stupid. Um, but anyway, sorry, I, I wish I had a better story, but I'm, I'm not all that original. Uh, there are some better fly names of mine out there, um, and, and typically I'm not the one that picked the name. So uh, Uncle's got another pattern of mine coming in the near future that has a much more original name, and it's, and it's quite a bit better than Creek Leech. Uh, so sorry, it is what it is. Um, low flow streamer fishing. Once again, this is where you would actually uh, alter your sink rate on your line. If you're using a sink tip, they make those in like type threes or type sixes a lot of times. You can take a type three to where you don't get the sink rate as rapidly uh, as you would in like a faster flowing water condition. Uh, so alter your sink tips, alter your full sink lines. Uh, in, in a low flow environment around here, I'll use a full sink line of like a type one, type three. Um, a lot of people ask what my favorite full sink line is. Unequivocally, just absolute favorite is the Scientific Angler Seamless Density. I love that line. I know they market it as a still water line, but it's based on their MPX taper. And I would dare say that most of you in your lifetime have probably cast a GPX or an MPX. And the MPX is uh, basically the refresh version of a GPX. Um, you fish that line or you know, thrown that for you know, dry fly fishing, nymph fishing, somewhere along the line, you probably cast a scientific angler GPX or MPX. The seamless density is modeled on that taper, which makes it an extraordinary casting line. It's so, so good. And uh, as somebody who really appreciates fly casting, I am a certified casting instructor. So it's one of those things that I, I enjoy a good fly cast. And uh, I don't like all these clunky, overweighted, you know, heavy lever sinking lines where they're just throwing that fly over really hard. I've got to be throwing a piece of meat to be able to throw that line and really, you know, really see the, uh, you know, the benefit of it, uh, especially in a bass realm. But man, the thing about the seamless density, they make it all the way up to, I believe it's an eight weight. They make it all the way up that high. And the thing that's awesome about it is you can actually present and target a spot and present the fly to that. So if you're trying to pound a bank, if you're trying to lay a streamer right behind a boulder, right behind a lay down, it allows you to target it so well without having to, you know, kind of choke back up on your cast on some of those heavier lines that really just leverage the fly over. Um, so low flows, maybe drop your tippet size, your leader size, Maybe drop your uh, sink rate on your sinking lines or do a longer leader on your floating line. 
Um, I got another question here about knots. Uh, what knots do I use when streamer fishing? Um, for me, I am a loop knot fiend. If it, if it is going to be a streamer and I want it to swim, it's going on a loop knot. I never direct tie with a clinch. Um, or, you know, there's a number of different ones out there. I mean, there's Davy knots, there's Palomar knots, there's clinch knots. There's all these different kinds of knots that are direct tie to the eye of the hook. If you want a, if you want to milk the absolute nth degree of efficiency out of a stringer pattern, put a loop knot on the eye of that hook. And people ask which one I use a lot. There's a lot of them out there. A lot of them are very good. I think one of the most simple to tie is called the non-slip or no-slip mono loop. Um, it's also called Lefty's Loop. If you look it up, I don't think Lefty Cray invented the knot, but nonetheless, uh, you know, he gets a lot of things named after him, and rightfully so. The uh, the thing that I would say is that knot is easy, easy to tie. It's basically an anchored clinch knot. Uh, you're tying a small overhand knot, leaving enough of a tag, running through the eye of the hook. You run right back through the overhand knot. You simply wrap the the line around in kind of clinch knot style fashion, and then run it through the overhand one last time and cinch it down. Um, very, very quick to tie. I use it a lot on my nymphs and my dries as well so that I get extra fly. I mean, it's pretty much the only knot I tie uh, for a main connection to a fly. I just think you get more motion out of it um, and it's just your ace in the hole. I mean, if you learn to be very, very quick at tying loop knots, it's a great thing to practice at home, <laughs> like on days like today when it's really cold. Uh, really, really good knot to have in your arsenal. Um, I love this question, and I, I'm going to try not to get too nerdy on this, but fluorocarbon or nylon? I am fluorocarbon all the way when it comes to this. Um, <laughs> they're telling me to get nerdy, so all right. I'm going to nerd out on this. Fluorocarbon versus nylon. Fluorocarbon, it sinks a little bit. It's totally uh, transparent in the water. Fish can't see it. Um, you have more abrasion resistance. It has less stretch. I mean, pretty much everything that I mentioned there compared to nylon is a benefit in streamer fishing. You're going to get a little bit more depth on your fly. You're going to have more abrasion resistance, which what are we trying to do? Fish it around cover, fish it against the bank, fish it on the bottom. You're getting all of that. And a lot of times you're fishing for bigger fish with a streamer. If that happens, you're looking at, you know, you've got a fish that, I mean, I don't know if you've looked at a brown trout's mouth lately, but when they get about so big, they've got a lot of teeth. And, uh, you know, bass, they've got abrasive mouths. It's not anything with super big teeth. You can lip them, but it's one of those things of it still feels like sandpaper in there. So if you've got a bucket about this big and you put a fly in it, all of a sudden that tippet is just getting raked across those teeth. Having that abrasion resistance is good just from the business end of the fish alone, not to mention all the garbage they're going to run you through. You hook a bass on the edge of, you know, a lay down or you hook it in a boulder field or you hook it and you know a, a bunch of lily pads for crying out loud that tippet's going to get put to the test you take a trout you hook it you know in front of another boulder and it wraps you around that and tries to get behind that uh behind that pocket behind the boulder and maybe even dive under the rock your tippet and leader are put to the test and so excellent fluorocarbon is an absolute weapon in your rigging arsenal i i don't use nylon at all when streamer fishing and some people may have their reasons I get that. I don't. I, I, I mean, like, I don't get it. I'm like, if I have less stretch, that means more sensitivity to the fish, a little bit more sink rate, more abrasion resistance. And let's be honest, I want to fish a bigger size tippet than I would ordinarily uh, with like a dry fly or a nymph. I want to put a little bit more of a uh, rope on there because you're going to have big fish eating big flies. Don't, don't be a wuss. Actually fish some tippet that you can cross a fish's eyes with when you set a hook. And like I said, you're going to get eats on these streamers that are going to make your insides hurt and while you're sitting there nursing your wounds you better be setting a hook and i'm using 10 12 16 pound a lot down here uh in in heavy cover i'm not scared to use 20 pound fluoro for bass in the trout world you know 10 10 and 12 is probably the heaviest i would ever go eight and ten is normally what i use um you know there are applications where that is not the rule you could actually go heavier there's no problem with that um, but there are a lot of great tippet brands out there. Obviously, uh, this is being brought to you by Umco, and they happen to make some of the best in the world. You've got your Phantom X stuff, man. That stuff's like secret sauce. You've got some pretty abrasion-resistant material that has gone through a lot of scientific research. There's a number of brands out there that do a great job, uh, but there's a couple out there that are obviously head and shoulders above the rest. So, uh, I know everybody's got their favorite. I'm not going to tell you what to do, but if you haven't given the Phantom stuff a try, it's good stuff. Uh, I know we carry it in the shop as well here. The uh, other thing I get questions on here, let's see, I got a couple. This is all kind of one question. Uh, rigging 
and tip it and leader. My setup, I typically tie my own. Um, and, and I know this is different. I normally get a bunch of leader like making material. And whether you, you know, there, like I said, there's a bajillion different brands out there. Whatever you want to do is fine. Um, but I get fluorocarbon leader making material. And I actually tie my own leaders for my streamer fishing. That way I can tailor them. I normally don't fish anything over a six foot leader. If it's going to be something where I'm fishing a floating line, I'll make it longer so that I get more of a sink rate. And in that instance, typically I'm using smaller streamers or it's a more finesse, and, uh, more finesse, I would say, oriented environment. And for that, I'll actually use a knotless leader, like, you know, just a pre-made, you know, nine to 12 foot leader that's fluorocarbon is fine if I'm trying to get a little bit more depth on, uh, you know, in a finesse situation on a floating line. But typically when I'm using sinking lines, I'm fishing a six footer. And uh, I typically do two, two, and two. Uh, and that's all it is. I'm doing like a two foot butt section of real heavy stuff, a two foot taper section where I step it down and a two foot tippet section uh, that goes directly to the fly. Now, I know everybody's got their technical recipes. This is like asking, you know, how do you rig a tarpon leader? And it, it's, this is like talking barbecue in Texas. Everybody's got an opinion and whatever yours is, it's wrong. So, I mean, that's kind of the whole deal of here is, with the streamer stuff, everybody's got their way of doing it. That's just my way of doing it. I'm not saying it's the only way of doing it. There's probably people that do it way better than I do. Um, but for me and what we do around here, I'm using a myriad of different sinking lines to get the job done. Um, and in many cases, I mean, this is this is dirty, actually. I mean, you can categorize this as streamer fishing, um, but I'll take a lot of diving hair bugs. I mean, I, I tell people all the time, if I got stuck in bass country and you only gave me one fly, what would it be? And sadly, it's not one of mine, but it's, <laughs> it's the Umqua Swimming Bait Fish. You give me that in a size, if I can have it in both sizes, I'd be happy. But if I can have it in a size four, I can own the world. And if you give me that and I can fish it on a floating line or a sinking line, I'm happy in bass country. It's got enough white in it that I can fish it when the water's dirty. And I mean, the thing that's awesome about it is you can literally take what is a diving bug or a topwater hair bug, and you can strip a sinking line and dive it much like you would use a crankbait or a stick bait in a tournament bass fishing situation. Um, so when you think about streamers that aren't heavily weighted, um, you know, Kelly Gallup has a lot of those patterns out there. There's a, uh, just a number of these big deer hair headed streamers that really don't dive all that much because they're not weighted all that heavily. If you depend on the line to do that for you and to pull that fly down, um, you know, there's a lot of folks that if you look at their streamer tying, um, it's impressive to see when you actually switch from a floating to sinking line, how the action of the fly and even the path of the fly underwater changes so much. If you have not fished a diving bug on a sinking line and you live in bass country, I am sorry you are just now hearing this. Um, you've missed out on a lot of life. The good news is there's hope for you and you can change your ways starting tomorrow. Uh, go to your local fly shop, buy a sinking line. Go fish a topwater fly and you can do it in the dead of winter and just watch how many eats you get. If the fish are deep, I'll fish a diving bug as deep as 15 feet. And I'll like when we have uh, vegetation that's starting to actually, uh, basically it goes dormant or actually recesses in the winter. A lot of times what I'll do is look for those transitional parts where the grass is still, you know, kind of receding back for the winter in that cooler water condition. Take a deep sinking line and something that actually will tick the top of those grass edges and oh my gosh, man, you can just get a bass to murder a fly. Um, and I'm sure in a, in a lot of still water trout situations, that can even be a very good technique with other types of streamers that aren't heavily weighted, where you get them to kind of hang in the column or stay right above that grass. Um, so that's some of my rigging. I know that's probably not fully comprehensive, but if there's any more questions, we've got a lot of, a lot of show left. All right, bass, trout, carp. Um, and how I fish the creek leech for each. And so that was the, the final question we had in the last segment, and then we'll introduce the next fly up. Um, for bass, it depends. If I'm fishing crystal clear water, you know, shallow hill country creeks, I'm gonna find a fish and I'm gonna treat it a lot like a bonefish. Uh, if I see a cruising bass, I'm gonna cast well past the fish and lead it. And then I'm gonna let the fly sink to the bottom. And I'm gonna try to crawl that fly in front of that fish's path and to where that fish just kind of happens upon the fly. Um, if, if they're being very, very picky like that, I can normally get an eat uh, by just literally crawling the fly across the bottom this much at a time. And I know that's laborious and terrible, but when you see a lot of our fish in our clear hill country streams, they're not your, I'll put it this way. You go to East Texas, 
you could put a sock on a hook and catch a fish out there. It's it's literally ridiculous. If you want to use a chartreuse popper that's that long and go throw it at daybreak, there is something going to come up and eat that. That's just no two ways about it. East Texas is a wonderful place. You put it around a boat dock, you put it around a stump, you put it on anything, they're going to eat it. You come to Central Texas, you do that same thing. Those fish are either running for cover or sitting there holding their sides because they're laughing at you so hard. Our fish in the hill country have PhDs a lot of times where they are literally looking at that fly, staring it down. They want it to convince them that it is real. And so that's why I crawl flies a lot across the bottom. If I have active fish that are very aggressive that don't mind a good chase, that's where I'll put that. I fish a lot of short strips. For me, it's just tick, 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 tick. And instead of these big, long, ripping strips like you see a lot of people fishing streamers, I fish a lot of this where it's just real tick. You know, I'm literally just kind of pinching the line with my fingers and throwing it downwards. Then you just get this real jerky, hoppy retrieve. I love that. And I, I use that a lot for trout with this fly, um, where the fly just has maximum action. And I do use a lot of the rod tip. I see a lot of people that just point the rod tip right at the fly and just strip. If you're not using a little bit of rod tip, and I know that probably offends somebody somewhere, but man, you can't just... Once again, uh, you heard in the, you heard on the tying <laughs> tying step by step that I used to be a tournament bass fisherman. Uh, the first thing I bought out of high school was a Ranger bass boat. I mowed a lot of yards, <laughs> and so I bought a bass boat, and I was like, I got to make my living in fishing. I still fly fished, and I loved it. I started fly tying at eleven. Uh, fly fish. I actually started tying flies before I started fly fishing. I got that totally out of order. Um, but interestingly enough, as I began to tournament bass fish, you know, I learned that honestly the fly fishing world has very little idea about bass fishing. I mean, and, and I told, uh, I told Umqua I was going to rat him out. 90% of Umqua's fly sales are trout. And, and in Texas, that's a very painful thing because we have one trout river. <laughs> and so mind you, we outfit a lot of people to head West and I've even done a little guide work up there. I've guided in four different States. And, you know, it's one of those things I'm, I'm familiar with it. And I'm very passionate about cutthroats. We do a lot of conservation work for Rio Grande cutthroat. Uh, in southern Colorado and northern New Mexico. In fact, that's why I have all the pictures of those on my wall, because that's one of my favorite fish on the earth. Um, but nonetheless, with tournament bass fishing, they spend millions and millions and millions of dollars on bait development and the research that goes into just one type of fish. You know, Umqua, you know, the, one of the largest leading fly manufacturers in the world 90% of their flies are trout. The other 10% is made up of, you know, jungle and, you know, offshore and flats and redfish. And, you know, then there's bass over here in a little dark corner that kind of gets a little dusty sometimes. So when they picked up the creek leech, I was like, it was a miracle. It was truly a miracle. And so I, I love this. You know, I'm hearing right now that they still love me and it's okay. I'm not trying to throw them under the rug too bad. I tie a lot of trout flies for Umqua too. And I'm, 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 I love trout fishing. I'm not knocking it. I do, I do a fair amount of it and guide for it every year. But the thing that, uh, the thing I will say is that bass, as we've learned it in fly fishing, we could actually take some lessons from our glitter boat brothers. And, uh, that's the thing that, uh, you know, our brothers and sisters that drive the glitter rockets, they, they know a thing or two about this fish. And uh, I learned a lot while tournament bass fishing. And so a lot of that carries over into my fly design even now. Um, and even retrieves and the way that I process things. I mean, when's the last time in fly fishing? We know about it for trout, you know, the seasonal changes and hatches and stuff like that. But in a bass world, we pattern fish, you know, where you actually find if you're on a lake and you find something working over here, chances are if the cover is similar over there, it's probably going to work. Well, on our larger bass rivers in the South, pattern fishing actually works, but it's never talked about in the fly arena. Uh, and so I'll let y'all kind of put that in your, in your kind of fishing box of tricks and start kind of mulling that over, let it offend you a little bit. And, and that's a great thing about being offended is it's always your fault. You, you can't control my actions, just your responses. So if that offends you, it's okay. It's your fault. Um, and so we'll, we'll work with it and we'll still love you, but Think about it. You do it for trout. You pattern fish with all of the different hatches, all the different, you know, cripples and emergers and all the life cycles of all this, all the entomology and all the intricacy. And then there's, you might ought to just throw a popper for that bass. And I'm like, God, really, is that as good as it gets? And there, there's more to it. So with that, to change the retrieve for trout, it's a short, quick for me on the creek leech. Um, and then for carp, obviously, it's more of a bottom, slow, consistent uh, oddly enough, the largest carp uh, that I have ever caught out of Brushy Creek, uh, about 20 pounds, I caught it last spring on a creek leech while fishing for bass, and I was using a full sink line crawling it right across the bottom. 
I thought I'd hook the bass of the century. And then there's the golden bonefish and there it goes. And uh, it was on a seven foot, seven inch Scott five weight. So uh, not enough rod for 20 pounds of fish, but it got it done. So props to Scott for making great sticks. So let's introduce our next fly. Uh, and I know we'll get more questions as we go along. Hopefully I answered a few of them there. Uh, we have got Brandon Mina's slider bugger. And uh, we're actually going to go through um, basically a little bit of what he told me about some of the fly development on it. He wanted a sub three inch sculpin pattern that was really more of kind of a walk wade fly. Uh, there's a lot of great sculpin imitations out there. Obviously, many of them larger, many of them developed to be, you know, these bottom crawling monsters or, you know, stuff that you can move a really big fish with. Three inches, I mean, is still a decent size fly. And, you know, you, you, can, you can get a lot of motion out of a fly that size. And that, I think that's one of the most undersold things about streamers is the fact that Everybody wants to tie a streamer, but we kind of forget that it's got to do all the things on its own. I mean, think about fish in a river. If you hang a fly in the current, it's going to sit there and pulse and do all the happy things. That's why we have swim tanks and stuff like that that we can put them in. How many of you have ever cast a fly in your swimming pool or gone out to a neighborhood pond and worked it after you tied it? It's the same thing. We're trying to make sure the fly will sell itself while it's doing nothing at all but hanging there. And that's the idea even behind the creek leech is if I pause it on the bottom, rabbit's moving, legs are floating. I can sell that to a fish with that thing sitting still. And that's something that I find a lot of people forget about in streamer fishing. But Marabou makes that happen. And as, you know, same thing here. A lot of the flies you will see tonight are going to have Marabou in them for that very reason. It's a pulsating, very breathe, breathable material under the water. I mean, it looks lifelike any which way you put it. Um, the thing was is you get a lot of like tungsten buggers and things like that. And what Brandon was really saying is that you can get a lot of tungsten buggers that are really good walk wade streamers. Uh, and obviously you can still fish all these flies out of a boat, um, but he wanted something that had a beefier profile, move a little bit more water, have that teardrop silhouette. And he put the deer hair head on it, basically helps shed water after it casts. And then also, as many of you know, if you put deer hair on the front of any, any weighted fly, cushions the, uh, the flies landing, you know, a bonefish slider, same thing. Um, you know, when Borski did that, you know, you've got a lot of uh, Gallops flies do that. A lot of uh, flies developed on the White River and stuff like that where you're throwing a lot of big, just gigantic flies. You know, these deer hair heads so that they shed water real quickly. They move a lot of water. They kick the fly from side to side. But also if they do have bead, uh, you know, bead eyes or any sort of lead eyes in the middle, that when that hits, it disperses that plop and actually allows the fly to, to land softer. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, I ask everybody about how they fish their flies. And Brandon said that the fly most often gets eaten on the initial drop. So when he hits it against the bank, it takes that real sharp nosedive going down. And he said, really make sure that, you know, watch the line, stay, stay tight on that. So that when, when you make that cast, that you're ready for an eat, because a lot of times they'll hear that initial plop, gets attention and they see the little sculpin diving down and it's, you know, they're on it like white on rice. And so that's the whole thing of you want to make sure that you're great right out the gate. Make sure you're paying attention, not a bunch of slack line all in there. One of the things of keep that tight, make the shot, get ready for the eat essentially right when it hits. So with that being said, we're gonna go ahead and launch into Brandon Mina's slider bugger. And uh, he's gonna walk you through some of the tying process. Hi everyone, Brandon Mena here, and I want to show you tonight how to tie the slider bugger. Um, this is going to be the uh, olive and ginger coloration. It's my favorite coloration to fish. It's a good sculpin coloration in my opinion, so it tends to be the one I reach for the most. For a hook, I have a Daiichi 2461 in the vise. This is a size 2, and then for thread, I just have some Danville 140. I'm going to start that on the hook. So for this pattern, you're going to need some large size lead dumbbell eyes. I like these orange ones quite a bit. These are the double pupils, super durable, really heavy, which is what I'm going for with this uh, big deer hair head this is going to have on it. I like to throw a little bit of super glue on that thread base and then use that to kind of help me lock in these eyes a bit. And just use a couple of X wraps to lock that in. Make sure those are lined up where I want them. Throw a couple wraps around the base of the eyes 
just to further lock those in. And then a little dab of glue on top of that as well. Now, one thing I want you to notice here is you see the front edge of the dumbbell eyes here. I try to get that fairly close to the back edge of the hook eye. It doesn't need to be perfect, but I find that to be a good uh, point of reference to allow for enough room to be able to tie on tip it when you put on that deer hair head. Okay, so like I said earlier, we're tying the olive and ginger uh, version. So I'm going to go ahead and take some sculpted olive marabou here. And I like to strip the marabou off of the stem when I tie it in. And then this one, I like to have a little bit longer tail on it. So uh, most of the time with streamer patterns, people are shooting for about, you know, one hook length for the tail. I like to go a little bit longer than that, probably about one and a half. On my vice, I find that if I go right to about the elbow on it, that seems to be about the length I'm looking for. I'm gonna need a little bit more marabou than that, so we're gonna strip some more off the stem from the other side. Then we'll take the ginger color, and I like to use a little bit less ginger than I did the olive color. Again, I'm just stripping that off the stem. And then I will use that olive for length. And just stack those. With those dumbbells being on top of the hook, I'm sure many of you know, but that's gonna cause this to right hook point up. So that ginger is actually my belly color for this uh, little sculpting pattern. I'm just throwing some thread over that marabou. Not the cleanest uh, marabou tie-in job, but it'll get the job done. Next, I'm gonna tie in my counter rib. It's gonna be some 5X tippet. I really like to use tippet for the counter ribs on most of my flies. I just find it to be actually surprisingly more durable than wire in most cases. Okay. And I'll just throw that in my material clip. I'm just gonna moisten those fibers a little bit to keep them out of my way. For the body, I'm gonna go ahead and use some brown olive ice dub. This is one of my favorite colors of ice dub to use. It's just super fishy color. And I'm just gonna go ahead and dub that on in a kind of like a chunky noodle. You could also throw a dubbing loop if you wanted to. Um, I don't feel that the durability is needed at that point just because you have a, some hack on the counter rib going through it, but some would argue it's uh, even faster than doing a big loop like this, big old noodle like this. So whichever you prefer is fine with me. Just need a little bit more on there. And then we just need to leave a little bit of space behind those eyes there. So I have a black barred olive uh, piece of hackle here, and this is a ginger one. And then I like to stack these on top of each other and try to move the fibers till I get to the point where the hackles are pretty, pretty close to the same size. Uh, I'm sure the fish don't care, but if I, I tend to like to have the olive one, if anything, be a little bit longer than the ginger one. And I've left those little stubbies in there, as you can see. Just something for that thread to bite into. Hopefully you can see that okay. All right, so I'll take my hackle pliers now. This hackle is probably long enough I could get away without hackle pliers, but I'll show you here in a second kind of why I like to have them. 
So we'll throw one wrap right there at the beginning and one right behind it. So kind of two close wraps there. And then we'll just palmer that back and open spirals. You can see it's kind of a little bit of a bulky hackle. I really do like that. Adds a lot of bulk in the water without adding a lot of casting weight. And then I'll use my counter rib there to grab a couple of tight wraps on there, right where that hackle is. And again, this is why I like the hackle pliers. It provides me a little bit of weight so I can use both hands to capture this hackle in. And I'm just gonna work that, uh, tip it through that hackle to lock it in. You can see these uh, hackle fibers are pretty webby, so they're gonna be a little bit messy or a lot messy until I uh, get this tied off and I'll throw some, I'll brush that, those fibers out a bit. And I like to make sure that I double that, tip it over a couple times and really lock it in. That tip, it can be a little slick sometimes. Then I'll just go ahead and grab my scissors and cut out the butts of that hackle, or tips, I guess in this case. And then I'll take a little Velcro brush and I'll just brush all that, those fibers out. And also loosen up some of that dubbing that's underneath that hackle. Okay, so let's go ahead and tie in some rubber legs now. You can use any uh, kind of brown or root beer colored legs that you like. These just happen to be some root beer silly legs. And I'll V-tie those in, uh, one per side. All right, now I'm gonna go ahead and whip finish. Forgot my whip finish tool, but I tend to like prefer to use a tool than a hand whip finish there, but should do fine. And then I'll take those legs and I like to trim them uh, short of the tail. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and grab a hair clip and I'm going to sweep everything back and hold it back with the clip for the deer hair work here. I'm going to go ahead and switch over to GSP now. I like using GSP just for the deer hair work on most of my streamer patterns. Um, I, I really do like having a wax thread for the body work, just like the way it locks in materials and dubs and things like that. But if you want to use GSP for the whole fly, that would work too, for sure. So I'm going to go ahead and take a little dot of super glue and place that right on top of the eyes. And kind of lock in that GSP and that Danville together. And then I have some olive uh, deer body hair here. You can also use belly hair if you like it. I think the trick is just finding a, a nice patch with some good tips because the tips, as you're going to see here, are pretty important to how the pattern looks. And this is a pretty healthy little clump here. And then what I'm going to do is I want to have the length of that be right about to the uh, hook point. So those tips are going to go to the hook point. I keep seeing broken tips every time I line it up, so I have to rip them out. Okay, so we got that lined up. I'm going to do a loose thread wrap to kind of gather that. And then another one, just slightly tighter to start to kind of save my work there a little bit. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my fingers to kind of hold that deer hair in place and pull straight down. That way it doesn't wrap around the hook too much. Okay, so we've cinched that down. I'm gonna go ahead and do a couple wraps just around the base of the eyes to kind of lock in that clump of hair. Like such. 
you can kind of see how that uh, kind of blank there at the bottom. And then what I like to do to cover that up is just use a little bit of Bruiser Blend dubbing. Just because I like the, the butter belly color a lot. I think it matches my belly color that I'm going for in this pattern, having that ginger belly with the ginger marigou tail. So I'm just gonna stack a little clump of this, like such. And then I'm gonna go ahead and capture that with the thread, almost like I'm V-tying it. And then this might be a little hard to see, but I'm gonna pull that straight in front of those eyes. So you can see how that gets locked there. And then pull the bruiser bone back and capture it around the back edge of it. And then I'll do one more lap around those the base of those eyes just to lock everything in. And now I'm gonna take some super glue and I'm gonna dab some super glue right on that dubbing and up against the uh, base of the hook eye there. A wet finish would probably be a little bit more durable, but I haven't had any issues just finishing this off with super glue there. We'll go ahead and cut that out. All right, so now the next step is to trim that head. I have a razor blade here. What I tend to like to do is use one, one, uh, one side of the razor blade per per, per uh, fly, I guess. So they're labeled, they have a one and a two on them, so I've already used the one, so I'm gonna make sure I use the two on this one, so I have a sharp blade. Grab a little catch bin here. And I'm gonna go ahead and bend that into a moon shape. Have, and then I'm going to find my hook eye there. I'm gonna use that kind of as a guide, along with the dumbbell eyes. making a sweeping motion there. And I kind of do a big broad cut first, just to kind of get my bearings. And then I'll start to trim it up a little bit nicer, a little bit tighter to that collar. You notice that I left that uh, little hair clip in. I do like leaving that in because when I don't, sometimes I nick the rubber legs with the razor blade and that can be frustrating. So now one thing that um, you have to be careful with on this pattern is you want to make sure that you don't have the head be too tall on here or it'll impede the hook gap. Um, I have never had any issues with hook gap up with this hook on this pattern, but uh, I do make sure that the head is not too tall there. Then I'm just going to make sure I clean out all those little butts there then I just like to kind of push and mold that head a little bit and then I'll take that razor blade which is probably why this is probably why I only get one fly per side of a razor blade and that's because I'm going to go ahead and run right along that hook eye and clear out a spot for me to tie in some tippet All right, let's go ahead and remove our hair clip here. So you can see we got a nice ginger belly with the olive top profile on here. Two tone flies always seem to be the winners for me. Um, and again, that's our slider bugger. Thanks so much. All right. I like that fly, man. That thing is awesome. The, the dubbing trick between the, uh, the dumbbell eyes, that's legit stuff right there. If you, if you got nothing else out of that, the use of a hair clip on your tying bench and the tricky little dubbing work right there around the eyes, that, that's stuff that you can implement on many different stringer patterns. Um, had a couple of questions uh, while we were out. Uh, not as many as the last round, but we can get to some of these. Uh, and once again, if you do have any questions, make sure you leave them in the comments uh, and we will definitely answer as many of those as we can. Um, eye positioning was one thing that, uh, that I wanted to bring up here. If you'll look at, uh, even the difference in the two flies, uh, you know, my Creek leech, the eyes are situated a little bit further back on Brandon's fly. It was situated a little bit further forward. 
Um, coincidentally, Brandon, in, in what he had told me is his fly dives a lot more on a kind of a nose down type situation, uh, and it provokes a lot of strikes on that initial drop. The creek leech, while it dives, it's going to be much more of a slanted dive because those eyes are situated further back on the hook. Um, so do be aware that as you situate those eyes or even position, uh, you know, any sort of weighted wire or anything like that on the hook, that it'll change the type of fall. And you can also change fall rates by how much or how little wire, how big the eyes are, how small they are, et cetera. Um, so that's something that I would make sure you definitely look at when you're tying streamers be aware that just simple things like where you put the eye on the hook, what type of hook you're using, things like that can very much uh, affect the fall and the rate of fall and also the style of the fall. Is it going to nose down? Is it going to glide down? Uh, or is it actually going to suspend? So something to look at. Uh, one of the questions we got was streamer color. When do you use what? And, you know, specifically kind of the whites, the blacks, the yellows, the olives. If you got those four main color groups, I mean, and I think that's actually pretty pretty good breakdown. I mean, there's obviously the outliers, you know, like your, you know, purples and, uh, you know, you've even got browns and stuff like that. But your white and black, those are very, very typical, you know, your white being more of kind of that general bait fish type, uh, you know, color pattern, you know, your blacks, they're just great for, you know, low light hours where you're trying to silhouette a fly. Um, and they're also really good for dirty water because they have a real strong silhouette, whether it be the fish looking up at them, or whether it be nearby. Um, and then olive, that's going to be that clear water. I mean, let's be honest. You can fish any fly as long as it's olive. I mean, I love that thing. I mean, that any sort of olive fly on clear water, I'm going to be happy. It may not be the right color, but it's going to get it done. Um, olive is such an awesome, just general usage color. I mean, and let's, I'm going to go back to the bass thing a little bit. And I'm sorry for all you trout guys out there, but I mean, we're talking streamers. So this applies in a lot of instances. And this applies in trout country too. I mean, think about how many people have olive buggers in their box? Okay, let's think about the tournament bass world. It's green pumpkin and watermelon, the two top colors of any plastic worm in anybody's, you know, tackle deck is going to be that watermelon, green pumpkin, those olive-esque or olive derivatives, if you will. So it's a very, very popular, you know, color scheme, not just in the fly tying arena, but also in the commercial fishing, you know, kind of your you know, I would say your bass, your tournament bass world and some of that more uh, professional league stuff. And so olive is definitely for me kind of that jack of all trades, but still clear water focus for me. And then yellow, I think, especially when you've got juvenile brown trout as a food base uh, or even dirty water, yellows show up pretty good in muddy water. I think it's really a good color to, you know, kind of get seen, get some attention. And it's also a really good reaction color where when you're fishing yellow stuff, a lot of times it's just a trigger color where that just sets them off. And I like that a lot. And, and I think that color deck is actually pretty solid where you've got a white, a black, a yellow, an olive. Uh, you know, like I said, you will have some others in there, purples. And uh, I know some guys who really like pink. Uh, you know, if you've got maybe rainbow trout or stuff like that, you know, rainbow trout, a uh, little, you know, fry in the system, that really works well. Or if you are fishing for stripers, uh, like on our trout fishery, we've got striper that'll best 50 pounds in there. And you're not throwing a rainbow trout pattern this long. You're throwing a rainbow trout pattern that long. So a little bit different uh, different arena there. We're actually fishing for the fish that eats the fish we normally fish for, if you can follow that. Um, let's uh, talk about this. We also had uh, a question about moving water. How does different material affect that? Feather versus rabbit versus deer hair. Why does that matter? Um, moving water. I mean, if you look at uh, you know a still water situation, you want that fly to be maximum motion at all times. But you have to keep in mind that if you have a fly that doesn't have materials like, you know, a soft hair, like a rabbit or an Arctic fox or something like that, um, you know, then you're not going to have that pulsating, undulating movement in the fly unless you, you know, fair, like feathers like marabou and uh, chickaboo, things like that. Those are really, really awesome. Even, even like elongated saddle feathers. Uh, one of my favorites, I feel like a lot of people miss this. Um, I do a lot of tying with Whiting Farms uh, products. I'm part of their pro team as well. And it's something that for, for their lineup, a lot of people forget, you know, in Cock de Leon, which is a very unique feather. It's actually more or less marketed as like, you know, you'll see it a lot in the Euro nymph world is, you know, just those like little tails on these little Euro nymphs and stuff like that. You'll see them used as legs. Uh, you'll even see some flies dry fly hackled with them, but they are an incredible streamer feather, especially the saddles because the, the actual quill, or if you want to be a real nerd and call it a rachis, you can, 
um, that the quill or the rachis goes all the way down the feather, but it's extremely small in diameter, a lot smaller than your typical saddle. So in this case, a saddle normally keeps its shape. Uh, like if you tie in, um, let's just say you're doing like a clouser half and half or something like that, just a general, you know, kind of all round bait fish pattern. If you tie that with normal saddles, you splay the saddles out in kind of a V shape. Well, normally you'll leave those there and they stick straight out. If you tie that same fly with Cock de Leon saddle, the feathers actually sag under their own weight. And that's a great thing. While it will, I don't really have much durability problem with it either. I mean, they're, they're making those chickens out of special stuff there, <laughs> stuff up there in Delta, Colorado. But the thing that's really cool about it is those Cock de Leon feathers, they undulate in the water. I use it all the time on the back of my diving bugs and a lot of my larger streamers. Uh, and it's a forgotten material. A lot of people don't choose to use those elongated feathers. Um, but it's neat because you get speckling patterns, barring patterns. So of course, you get them dyed. Uh, and then you can palmer them as well. And they're still very fibrous and make a really, really great uh, collar for any sort of transition into deer hair. I love that sort of stuff. Um, but, you know, deer hair doesn't have much motion to it. But what it does, uh, and in Brandon's pattern, this is a perfect example. What it does is it has that nice kind of ball shape or kind of that rounded dome shaped head. And it kicks that water into that deer hair collar and it forces water different directions over the collar. And so that marabou in the back is just constantly dancing and swimming. The hackle he put in there is undulating. You know, you get different sparkle off the dubbing. I mean, dude, seriously, the, the slider bugger's got so much going for it. I mean, it, that's the thing I love about a fly that's structured like that is it's got motion. It has something that's forcing that motion to occur and the natural materials that allow it to happen on its own, even if the fly's at rest. So, I mean, it's, it's, got, it's got the full meal deal in that fly, and I love that. Um, and that's another thing we'll mention about deer hair is, you know, when you apply that to a streamer, you got to think about it. Are you wanting a streamer that's going to wake right under the surface of the water? Are you going to put that, you know, a heavy set of lead eyes on there and you want to cushion the fall a little bit uh, or cushion the blow of when it hits the water from the cast? You know, there's multiple things that come into play there. Um, the other thing is, is even the ability of a hook to ride itself. You know, if you actually have lead eyes on the bottom of the hook where you're trying to get it to ride inverted with the hook point up, you know, that deer hair puts a little flotation on the top side of the hook and actually increases uh, the resistance of, you know, the fly against the water so that the weight is concentrated on the bottom side, the buoyant and the resistant stuff is up top that will help right the fly a lot quicker. Uh, and as a result, you won't have, you know, flies that foul as much. And a lot of times when you strip them, they'll pitch a lot that way and they'll roll. I love that, man. That's the best thing. If you've got a struggling bait fish pattern that will pitch or roll, it's going to just get smoked. And it doesn't matter what the fish is. If that fish eats other fish and you're fishing a fly that instead of just, you know, chugging linearly, it'll pitch and kick, game over. That, I mean, once again, that, that, that fly is just a death wish. That's all it's what it wants to die. And so that's the whole thing. If you can get something like that, it, I mean, it's an amazing fly to fish when you get that deer hair head motion oriented materials that allow the fly to kick and pulsate. Um, how do you know whether to fish a streamer or dry flies or nymphs? What are you looking for? That is a great question. So let's roll this over into the trout arena specifically. Um, you know, dry flies, you know, first off, I feel like that one's one, one of the more obvious ones where you are seeing actively rising fish, you see bugs in the air, bugs on the water, you know, there's, you know, whether fish are sipping, whether they're coming all the way out of the water, leaping and grabbing stuff like, you know, damselflies, dragonflies, or, you know, grasshoppers like terrestrials are falling in the water and you see those getting slurped, whatever you need to do there. But that's more of a visual game. Um, and then sometimes you can even time it right, where if you're on a certain river and you know that, hey, we've been getting a, sun, a sunrise hatch every morning of thus and such. Well, even if the hatch isn't coming off, but those fish are kind of accustomed to that during the season, you can be kind of the forerunner for all of that. Get out there and actually put a fly on the water before the bugs really get active. And sometimes you'll see that happen. And you can prospect with dries as well. There's plenty of times that I go dry fly fish that I'm like, I just really want to see something eat a dry fly. And I mean, mind you, nymphs would probably catch more fish, but it's just you get in the rut of like, I just want to see a trout's head come through the water and eat this thing where I can see it. And there's no fault in that. I think that's one of fly fishing's finest moments is seeing one of those trout just tip back on a dry fly and slurp it. I think that's one of the greatest things in the entire sport. And uh, there are plenty of people in this world that would agree with me. Um, but with that dry fly for me is more of a visual affair. Uh, I either desire them to eat that fly, which I think all of us do. I mean, that's the goal of fishing is you want to get the fly eaten. 
But the other, th other side of it is you see active insects or active fish that are feeding on top. And that's something that that's where I would do the dry fly thing. Nymphs, if I just flat out think that the fish are picky, I'm not moving fish with streamers. I love fish and streamers. Throw it out there. It's a better way to prospect. If you're through open water or, you know, you got some big cover and a very likelihood of larger fish that feed on larger prey items, especially in heavier water, like where it's faster flowing, um, I'll definitely put a streamer on and see if I can get a reaction bite, see if I can move a larger fish. And it's funny, a lot of the places that I nymph fish, I can run a streamer right through it and still pull fish. Um, I think that you you have the option of going either way there. I think what really comes down to is if I'm not moving fish on streamers or I'm not getting the bites, if I run back through that water with nymphs, a lot of times I will pick up fish. And it's just simply they aren't really keying in on the larger prey items. And I, I know that there are some exceptions to that, and we could probably bore you with all of that tonight. But the main thing is, is I'm looking at it as a style of fishing they're both subsurface, but I'm going to try to actually incite a bite with a streamer. With nymphs, I'm matching a hatch. I'm trying to put the, I'm going to knock that fly into that fish's nose. And if I've got a brown trout, you know, sitting up where I can see it and he will not eat or dry, my first option is going to be to throw a, a nymph on him because I really do believe if he's refusing bigger flies, you know, the dry dropper thing isn't doing him, but he's glancing at the fly, I'll put, you know, a, a double nymph rig on and make sure that I'm really down there in his face. Some people, they don't want to do that. They'd rather just throw meat at him, and if he doesn't eat it, they'll move on to the next fish. To each their own, that's totally fine. I fish a lot of tailwaters, so streamers, especially in pressured tailwaters, I find that even some of our fish here, they'll get conditioned to streamers. Well, I've actually seen fish run from them uh, because they see so many of them. And even certain types of retrieves, they will run from because that classic just strip, 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 retrieve doesn't do anything for them after they've seen it about umpteen jillion times. And so being able to, you know, modify your retrieves, modify your patterns, even your sink rates, and, and realizing that the average angler is probably not fishing a sinking line out there. If you throw a sinking line, it's going to keep that fly traveling, you know, laterally across the bottom and not pulling back up to the surface away from the fish. It allows that fish to stay comfortable when it eats. And I think that that's one of the things I really do uh, look for when I'm doing this is making sure that I'm tailoring the presentation to what the fish want, whether it's dry nymph or streamer, you got to have all on you at all times. But the thing that I think is really important is let the fish be your teachers. And uh, that's the most important thing is watch how they react to a fly. And if you can't physically see that, then prospect with that in mind. Um, lastly, before we jump into uh, Charlie Craven's uh, swim coach here, first off, if you are watching this on Instagram, recommend you jump to YouTube so that you get the full, uh, full view of the fly. Uh, Instagram crops this feed quite a bit. Um, but the YouTube feed is going to be quite a bit wider and it's going to allow you to see the fly because Charlie, his flies look really darn good. And so he gets that camera right up on it because he know he, he, he's not going to make a mistake on camera. Uh, and so it's one of those things of he wants you to scrutinize every single thread wrap. So give, give him give him the honor of actually looking at it on YouTube. And, and, and if you find that he made a mistake, call it out, please. We would like to know. Um, and whether he admits to it or not is another story, but I am all about all about you calling Mr. Craven out. Uh, talked to him on the phone this morning uh, about his swim coach, and this is this is one that actually uh, we fish a lot down here. So uh, I told him, I was like, hey, I want a little history on the fly, and that's about it. I said, I know what it can do from a fishing standpoint. I have seen bass trip over themselves trying to get that thing in their mouth. I mean, they just literally, we had one fish on the San Marcos River, uh, I was fishing with a guide, uh, a guide here we have at the shop, Marcus Rodriguez. Uh, he's guided the Texas Hill Country for, I think, over 25 years now. Uh, I used to read his blogs when I was a teenager. And, uh, man, he is just an incredible guide. Marcus could catch a bass out of your bathtub. And even though there's not a bass in your bathtub, he can make it happen. I don't know how that works. The guy literally can cause fish to, like, materialize. Um, so it's a very good quality in a guide. I don't know how, I don't know how he does it. It actually is somewhat irritating. Um, but I'm also the, when it's, when I'm the beneficiary of I'm on the front of the boat and he's on the sticks, it works out really well. Uh, and the guy is literally a wizard in a canoe. Like if I'm in a canoe, I'm knocking all around, making a ton of noise. He goes and like shoots a rapid and the, the, the paddle never hits the side of the boat. We're on the devil's river in West Texas one time. And I literally hear just, you know, just a slight knock. And I hear this uh, in the back of the boat. And I was like, what? And he goes, I hit the boat. I was like, man, are, are you kidding? I mean, if I'm back there, it sounds like friggin' people tap dancing back there, but it's, <laughs> Marcus is deaf, <laughs> deaf in a canoe, man. He's like gonna sneak up. He's quieter than a heron. It's incredible. 
But we're on the San Marcos River. He drops us through a rapid. We're right on the right in the corner there, and uh, we we do a little fly change up. So I threw him on the bow of the boat. I get on the sticks, and uh, we switched over to a swim coach. I said, put it right in the corner. And man, first corner we stick it into. He strips that fly out. We see this fish come right out of left field, and it literally we let the fly fall, and it stands straight up and pins the fly. And we were just laughing. I mean, it was just funny to watch a fish eat a fly like that, where they literally stand on their head to eat it. And uh, man, I know this fly moves plenty of bass, plenty of trout. Uh, obviously, it comes in a large and a small size. Um, I asked where the name come from. So we had we had about the, the creek leech was the boring name of the evening. I mean, who gives a rip about that? It's a leech and we creek fish with it. The swim coach is a much better story. And uh, he said he mentions in his streamer book, he, he goes through the entire story and I'll probably not do it justice. Uh, I was laughing quite hard on the phone when he told it to me today. Uh, but nonetheless, he was fishing with a friend of his, uh, uh, Blake Clark up in Wyoming, and he's up there. And the thing that was funny about it is he literally just opened a box. And, and like any of us fly tires and fly designers, we have a lot of flies that don't see the light of day. Uh, and we tie them, we leave them in the box. And it's like, you know, I'll save that for a rainy day. So he told Blake, he's like, hey, just pick out which one you want. Just pick one of these out. So he ties on what is now the swim coach. Well, Charlie was doing something in the back of the boat and uh, was looking down and, uh, all of a sudden they get in a little rough water and he literally went from sitting in the boat seat to in the water in a, a, just a blink of an eye. And so he trailed the boat down river a good ways and lost both of his flip flops, which were later recovered at the end of the day. And there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the story that was pretty funny. He's like, you know, it was pretty peaceful actually floating down whitewater. And he goes, I, you know, and people say it's peaceful before you die. He goes, so, you know, I just wrote it. But anyway, the whole thing is he gets, they, they get back to uh, the end of the day, they're back at the shop kind of debriefing. And uh, the fly did really well. And they're like, hey, we need a name for that fly. And uh, so it was suggested they name it after Blake. And uh, he's like, great, we'll call it the swim coach. He's like, because he's sitting there, swim, swim, swim. The whole time he's floating down river trying to get out of the out of the rapids. So swim coach was a much better name and a much better story than uh, a creek leech. That's pretty boring. Um, the thing that, I, that I've talked to Charlie about, and I, and I have to give him absolute kudos for this, big fly, big profile, not a lot of material uses a lot of steelhead-esque techniques that you would use for, you know, flaring materials, building up heads that don't retain a lot of water, maximum motion, maximum profile, minimal material. What's also really great about that is it causes the fly to be translucent. And I think that's one of the things that if you can add a little mystery to your streamer, I think there's a lot of streamers out there that they are just carving copies of whatever they're trying to, you know, replicate. With some of the flies where they're a little bit more impressionistic, the fish kind of have to put two and two together. And the thing that's really neat about that is it forces them to inspect it. And sometimes they just don't give a rip. They're like, it's close enough, and they just eat it. But when they have to interpret the fly a little bit, that curiosity comes up in a fish, and they don't immediately reject it. A lot of times they'll follow it, even if they don't really want to eat it. They scrutinize it hard enough that if you'll throw a weird jerk or a strip in it, a lot of times it'll provoke a stripe while it's actually being uh, inspected and scrutinized. So one of the things I do like about that. Uh, but nonetheless, this thing started out as just a stashed away box fly. So keep in mind, some of your designs that you have stashed away in your fly box that you're saving for rainy days could be your heavy hitters. So make sure you take a little time to dig back through your fly boxes and pull out your rainy day flies. Uh, without further ado, we're going to launch into Charlie Craven's Swim Coach. Okay, so here we're going to tie my uh, one of my favorite streamers. Um, this one's called the Swim Coach, and I'm going to tie you a yellow version, which is as of yet not available, but I think something that we're going to introduce here in the next year. And uh, I'm going to start with a uh, Daiichi 2461, and we're going to tie a full size swim coach. Uh, so this is a 2461 size four. This is going to be the rear hook. Uh, this is an articulated fly, so he's going to have two hooks. Uh, I'm going to start with some 3 out Danville Monocord in yellow. And I'm going to dress just the oh, front quarter or so of this hook shank. And at this point, I'm going to take just a tiny little bit of yellow ice dubbing. I'm going to twist this on my thread. 
And we're going to use this as a spreader. Um, the whole idea of this fly um, is that we're going to have a, a fly with a wide profile, but without a lot of materials. Um, I don't like casting big, heavy flies. I like big flies, but I don't like casting them. Uh, so I was trying to build a fly that had a, a big outside profile without uh, a ton of materials or uh, that was heavy to cast. Uh, so I just put that little ball of dubbing on, and that's going to be a spreader. Then I'm going to take, oh, six or eight or ten strands of uh, light olive ripple ice fiber. Six or eight strands or ten or twelve, just a little pinch of each of these, and then some yellow ripple ice. And I just stack all three of those colors on top of each other. I don't worry about trying to keep them even at all. And I'm going to tie these in at the center of their length. I'll fold that front end back and just let that dangle back. And you can see that's fairly ragged. If you got anything extra long, you can trim it out, but I don't want that cut square. I want that sort of, sort of ragged. Um, I realize that is now coming off the screen. So fairly long. And now I'm going to build a collar. And this is the part of the fly that, that the whole fly is based off of. Um, this collar is going to be um, uh, American Possum, and we're going to use dyed yellow um, in a dubbing loop. So I'm going to take, this is a Dyna King dubbing whorl, and I'm going to take this dubbing whorl, and I'm going to make a loop that's about maybe three or four inches. I'll cross my thread over it to close it up. And then I'll slide my material spring forward, and I just take one leg and I put it in my material spring. Let me bump you over just a little bit here. Looks like an earthquake. Uh, there we go, that's a little better. Um, you can see back here in my material spring, this leg I've got kind of propped up in my material spring. That'll keep that from spinning in the meantime. Um, and I'll show you, the, show you the tool here as we get going. Um, so then to put the fur in the loop, um, there's all kinds of tools sold these days. Um, you know, and the idea is that they uh, make it easier to, to make a dubbing loop. But really, I just use my fingers, and I'm not going to use a whole lot of fur. What I'm going to do is separate out a clump here, and I'll cut it off the hide, close to the hide. And I just pinch it in my fingers, like so. Sometimes there'll be some of these extra long guard hairs, and I'll usually peel those out. If I don't get all of them, I don't worry too much about it. And I'll take this fur, and I'll take my, my loop here, and I'll put this fur in between the two strands of the loop. And then I'll come in and I wanna trim the, the butt ends of that fur a little more square. And I'll tuck them right up to the, to the ends. So that is now in our dubbing loop. And I'll pinch the, pinch the threads right underneath the fur, and then I'll spin the tool. And let that spin up, and that'll make a big, wild strand of fur chenille. And once you get that on there, you can kind of use your dubbing brush to kind of pick out anything that got bound down. Not usually, uh, there's not usually too much that's bound down in there. So now I'm going to use the tool to wrap these, and I'm going to wrap this just like a, like a wet fly style collar, kind of comb it back after each turn. And it doesn't take much, you know, even what I've got in there might be a bit much. Sweep that back until I end up with bare thread, and then I'll tie that off on the bare thread with a few turns and trim that out. Um, that's the Dunny King dubbing rule, by the way. Then I'll take my, my dubbing brush here and just sort of sweep everything back. You're just making a big, you know, kind of fur hackle collar. So I want that all swept back. We'll take a few turns over the front edge there. You can see how big that fly got very quickly with very little material on it. So we've got a, a big outside profile, not a whole lot of stuff in there. Um, and then to, uh, to finish off the front end of the back hook, I'm going to take a mallard flag feather. Let's find us a nice pretty one here. Um, and these start off like this. And what I'll do is I'm going to create a separation point at the tip. And I don't need very much fiber here. Uh, so all the stuff on the bottom end I can strip off.
so that I'm left with like so. I want fairly long long fibers, at least as long as that, uh, or close to as long as that fur is. And I'm going to tie this in by its tip end here, just up here behind the hook eye. And you do want to make sure you anchor it tightly. So I'd like to come forward over that tip and then fold that back again and catch it again. And usually I'll come in and trim that tip out just so we don't have that big clump in there. Grab my good scissors here. So now I'm going to pick this up and grab the base of this feather in my hackle pliers. And I'm going to fold these fibers back. Um, again, just like a, like a partridge feather or a, a hen saddle feather, I'm going to fold these fibers back to one side, creating a V. You can see the, the stem is at the center of that V if I hold that just right for you. I'm going to sweep those back and I'm going to start to wrap. And it kind of helps to, to comb these back after each turn. And tie that off just behind the hook eye. Come in and trim that, that stem out. And I'm just going to build a nice smooth little thread head over this. And I'll whip finish right on top. So that's the back end. Get a good tight whip finish, maybe get a couple just to smooth that off. I'll come in with my dubbing brush just to sweep that back. So that adds a little bit of modeling to the fly. Um, we'll put a little shot of Solares Bone Dry Plus on that thread head. And typically when I do a bundle of these, I'll, uh, I'll do all the back hooks first and then come through and uh, attach them to the front hook. Uh, so they're sort of stage tied. But we've got our, our back hook taken care of. Um, now I'm going to set up my, my front hook, so bear with me, I'll be right back. All right, now we're going to continue on with the, uh, the front hook. And this is a uh, Daiichi 2461 size 2. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is take a quarter inch gold bead, put that on the hook like so, and then start the yellow thread behind it. Now what I want to do here on the back half or so of the hook is to build a nice even thread base all the way back to the bend and then forward again. And I'll take some senyo wire and I'm going to take this piece and I'm going to tie it just off center on the far side of the hook, uh, or just off the top on to the toward the far side, and wrap back over it all the way tight to the bend. And then I'll take a 3D bead, and I'm going to use a yellow one here, and I'll thread that on there. And that the idea of that 3D bead is that's going to give us some distance between the fly, uh, but it also helps to keep the the front hook, excuse me, the the back hook from from fouling on the front hook. So I'll thread my back hook on there, and then I'll push that wire right back through that 3D bead. Like so, and I'll catch the other end sort of on my near side of the hook. And I want to wrap over that. Nice and tight, very firm wraps here. Anchor in that down good and, good and tight to the hook shank to about halfway up. Now don't cut that wire with your good scissors. Uh, I'm going to use my, my D-bar pliers here, the cutters. I'll lop that end off. And then typically a shot of super glue here, but head cement will work because I'm not going to wait for the super glue to dry. So uh, for the record, when I uh, am tying these in a batch, I'll super glue that and whip finish that there and leave that alone. Just let that let that sit, and then I'll come back and do them all at once. So um, we'll just imagine that that was super glue, even though it's not really. So now I'm going to add some weight. Um, that big bead is going to be the spreader for the front of the fly, so the weight is really going to come from this lead wire, um, and that's just a brass bead. Um, I don't use a tungsten bead there because I've got room for the lead. This is a big fly, so I don't need to, to go to the expense of tungsten. Um, but I'm going to make several, 10, 12, 13 turns 
of 025 to 035 lead wire. And I'll break those ends off. And you can see I can push that bead back over the top of that. So that'll create some room there. And I'll cross hatch that just to sort of anchor that in place. Now I'm going to take another mallard flank feather. And this is just going to kind of cover this, this joint between the two. Uh, let's find a good one here. So I want a little bit bigger feather here. And I'll prep it the same way that I did on that first hook, creating that separation point. Like so, you can see I've just stroked the fibers back. I'm going to tie this in at the bend. And I'll grab the butt end in my hackle pliers and I'll fold this feather the same way I did that first one. Um, sometimes that happens right there. Sometimes that pulls out and breaks. Um, what I did there is just tied that in too close to that fine tip. So I'm just going to bump him back a little bit. Get on a little bit coarser piece of, of feather. Unwind those turns and tie this in again. We'll try that one more time. So I'm going to fold those fibers back. I'm going to start to wrap this feather back here at the bend. And I want these, these turns really just in front of the hook bend. Um, and they'll tangle around the hook bend as you wrap them. They're not going to kind of splay out real pretty just yet. Um, but I'm not too terribly worried about that. We'll have a chance to fix that. Um, as a matter of fact, don't, don't be tempted to sweep them with your fingers because they'll, uh, they're buried there with the hook point and you'll invariably end up with that hook point stuck in your hand, which is no fun for anybody. Uh, so once I've got that tied off, then I could take my dubbing brush and sweep those fibers back. And you can see how that sort of bleeds that front hook into the back hook a bit better. So now I'm going to take a little pinch of hot yellow ice dub again, same dub that we used on the, on the back hook. And I'm going to just direct dub this to build a fat body. So I've just twisted one end up. You can see how the rest of the clump is fairly loose. And I'm going to start wrapping. And as I wrap, that dubbing clump twists around the thread and allows me to build this big fat body pretty quickly, just up to cover up that lead, like so. So now I'm going to take my cone, or I'm sorry, my, my bead, and push it back, and I'll just jump the thread over it to the front. You can see I've only got about a quarter of a shank left in front of that bead. Um, again, that bead is going to be used as the spreader here. The whole idea of that is that's going to help spread those fibers. Um, so I'm going to continue with my thread base up to the hook eye and back again. Um, the, the thought process on this is that this is going to help to, sp to stand those fibers up so that the bigger the bead there, the, the better off you are. Um, now I'm going to take and make one more little dubbing loop. This one doesn't have to be very big. And I'll take another little pinch of that same yellow possum. Doesn't take much. Um, you hear me keep saying it doesn't take much, it doesn't take much, it really doesn't. Um, you know, in the case of these flies, uh, we're trying to build a big fly with a little bit of material, so don't uh, don't get carried away and, and use a big wad. I'll put this little pinch in between those two strands of the dubbing loop. Twist that up. And I don't let this twist crazy. This, this hair is fairly stiff as it is. You know, it looks like, uh, looks like rabbit fur, but it's got a, a fair bit more uh, rigidity to it. So that's one of the things that makes it stand up so well. Uh, rabbit fur is not a good substitute for, for what we're trying to do here. And I'll tie that off with a couple of turns. Trim that center out. Sweep that back, just get a couple turns there. You can see the, the whole idea is to sort of jam this up against the front edge of that cone. That buys me a little more room for the work I've got to do here. So you can see how that's standing up pretty tall. Get these few loose fibers out of the way here. Now I'm going to take that same flash that we used on the tail end. So same kind of multicolored 
gold, light olive, and yellow ripple ice fiber. And I'll just take these and stack them on my on my desktop. And I'm going to lay these in sort of at an angle across the hook and tie them down at the center of their length with a couple of turns. Then I'm going to pull the front end back and let it spread so that that flash ends up tied in in a big wide V. Uh, again, that's creating area. And then I'll take one more mallard feather. And I'll tie it in at the, by the tip at the front edge of that flash. I'll grab it in my hackle pliers and I'll fold those fibers back. So you can see what you did on the first hook is what you do two more times on the on the front hook. So while this fly seems complicated, it's it's really fairly easy to tie. There's not a lot of different materials on this one. A couple fibers getting bound up there. A couple turns of mallard. And you can see that just adds the sort of variegated highlight. Anchor that down. I usually brush that out just a bit, just to loosen those fibers up. Um, this fly obviously has some steelhead fly uh, lineage. Is sort of where this comes from. Um, get you a little better focus there. And then to finish them off, we're going to put in yet one more collar. Um, and again, I'll say it one more time. It's not going to take very much. Um, we're going to make another little dubbing loop. We don't have much room there, so we don't need much and, or have room for much. We'll pull those guard hairs out. I like to square those ends up a bit. So we've got a nice clean, clean edge on them. And I'll put this in my dubbing loop. And I'll spin that up. I'll let that spin. Kind of make that big fur chenille head. And I'm going to start to wrap this just in front of that, that mallard. Um, now typically I'll wet my fingers a bit and I kind of let these wraps almost overlap. They kind of really pack in tightly here at the front. And you can see I can kind of pull back and give myself some room. It's just that thread core that needs to go tightly around the hook. Everything else is standing out from it. So that it's standing up tall like that. And that's going to give us a lot, of, a lot of height and width to the fly. And I'll trim that out. Wet my fingers a bit. Just again, just treat this like a, like a big soft tackle. I'll build just a little thread head there. It's not going not to be very big or very prominent at all. And then I'll whip finish just up there behind the hook eye. All right, we're looking pretty good. And now to kind of get our final shape, I'm just going to use my brush a bit to sweep everything back. And I'm going to take some six millimeter living eyes. Uh, these are, uh, I'll pull them up here and show them to you. Sort of a gold color, um, and you know, honestly, you could use whatever, uh, whatever eyes you like. Okay, so we probably had a uh, bit of an abrupt uh, segue there. Um, I decided I didn't like the way I was doing the eyes on that first batch, so I uh, um, am going to show you uh, a little bit easier way to do them, and I'm going to still try to do it in the vise so that you can see them, but I think I can do it a little better now. Um, what I've done in the with the fly in the meantime is I wetted it down and let it dry. And you can see that swept some of this hair back. And then I've come in with my scissors and trimmed off anything that was short up here um, to kind of smooth the base for the eyes that we're about to put on. Um, and what I've got are some 3 16th inch uh, holographic dome eyes um, in gold color, but really the color is up to you. Uh, but what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna turn the fly and I'm gonna take, this is some solar as medium and I'm gonna take and just squeeze a little dab onto the side of the fly. And I'm going to take one of these eyes and just set it on top of that solar as. 
Um, now one of the tricks, can I get that where you can see it? Uh, one of the tricks to keeping that off of your fingers um, is to use a half inch tool and you can press that eye into place without getting the resin on your fingers. And I'll just cook that for a second. That's just gonna tack that eye down. And then I'll do the same thing on my near side here. I want to obviously try to keep the eyes symmetrical. Another little glob on there. And one more eye. And as you do more of these, you'll get a little more adept at getting them in place. So I'll push him down right in line and then cook that a bit. And then those eyes are tacked in. Now what I want to do here is I want to build a bit of a, a mask up here around the front of the, the head. Um, so the mask, the resin mask, is going to come from the, from the hook eye or the thread head um, up about halfway up the eyes. Um, so I'm not going to cover the eyes. I'm, I'm going to cover just the front half of the eyes. Um, and again, I usually do this in my hand, but I'm trying to get it so that you can see it. So hopefully I won't screw it up too bad. But I'm going to take a glob of that resin and put it on my needle. And sort of smooth it from eye to eye across the top of the fly. Um, and it'll start to kind of sink in to the fur there, which is, which is good. That's sort of what we're shooting for. I'll do the same thing on the bottom. You've got plenty of chance to sort of work with this stuff. You know, resin, that's the, the beauty of resin, is it doesn't cure until you say it cures. So um, you've got a lot, of, a lot of working time. I'm going to build that mask on the front end there. Just kind of smooth everything out. And again, I'm coming up about halfway up the eye on both sides. Get just a touch more here. Wipe my extra off, and then I can kind of smooth this out. And again, um, you know, usually I'll do, you know, all the flies up till this point, and then do the. Uh, uh, do the eyes all at once, and I, I will say that uh, you know, sort of doing them in a batch like that, you get a little more practice. You're a little more smooth with it. But that's our uh, pretty happy with that coat there, and then cook that from far away, kind of on and off with the lamp to get those cured in. And then you can see again down here, I've got some resin on those individual fibers. I can just sort of peel those out. And we'll fluff our fly up again. And that is our, our finished swim coach. That, uh, um, this is a really swimmy fly. It, uh, uh, this back end really wiggles around a lot in the water. It's very limp. It's got a lot of action to it. Um, and this is a, a big fly that doesn't use a lot of material, so it's relatively easy to cast and, uh, uh, you know, sinks well, uh, which is the whole idea. But that's my, uh, my sort of version of the uh, of a, a steelhead uh, style uh, trout streamer. Uh, that's the swim coach. And uh, keep your eye out for it. Pick you up some, tie, tie up some, and let me know what you think. Thanks for watching. I'm Charlie Craven. All right, one of the one of the standards in my box. I love that fly. Um, we had a couple of questions, and then we're going to talk materials a little bit. I got some uh, fun feathers over here. We'll talk about, and as you notice behind me, um, I don't have a feather problem. I, I, it's not a problem unless you admit that it's a problem. I think that's kind of how that works. So, therefore, I don't have one. So, considering this is what I do for a living, I don't have a feather problem. 
um, I would say I'm a bit of an aficionado or, you know, I have an affinity towards, you know, fine hackle and such. I, I don't know how I'd want to put that. But nonetheless, we'll talk about materials a little bit. And we're going to talk about kind of streamer classifications, uh, different prey items and things like that. Uh, and I will give everybody, this is our last segment before I close and introduce uh, John Bond's Dragon uh, for our final tie of the night. Um, but I'll close this out before that. Um, and I mean, this could be about as predictable as being at church when the pastor says he's going to close. This could go for, you know, 20 minutes. We'll see what happens. But nonetheless, what we're going to do here is discuss some materials. We're going to go ahead and talk about streamer classifications. But if you do have any questions and you're watching this live, um, you know, make sure that you chime in in the comments. I'd love to answer anybody's questions that you've had about any of the flies tonight uh, or just streamer fishing in general. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to do that. I mean, Heck, I mean, it's late enough now. We could even talk about our feelings if you want to. So, I mean, whatever, whatever we need to do, I'll, I'll try my best to answer questions. Uh, so, nonetheless, <laughs> somebody goes, the feather problem has me. No, I, I was about to say, it, it's me and feathers. We're like this. It's, it's good. We are tight. So, all right, let's talk materials for just a second. There are so many different types of materials. I mean, for streamer, streamer patterns in general. I mean, and a lot of times you'll see synthetics and stuff like that enter the streamer world and they do a very good job, especially all your flashes. But one of the things that I really will key on and, and that is motion. Uh, motion is key in the streamer world. If you've got a fly that moves, you've got a fly that sells itself at rest. And so one of the things I would mention I mean, marabou and stuff like that's really awesome, but I don't know how well you'll be able to see this on camera, but this is a super, super fibrous marabou. And this is actually chickaboo from Whiting Farms. This is a spay soft tackle chickaboo. It comes off a spay rooster. Uh, and, you know, the interesting thing is, is every one of these back here, so this is actually the chickaboo portion. This is the soft tackle portion. Everything from my grip up is all chickaboo. Every one of these, if I were to pluck one of these, I think this color is awesome, by the way. It's lavender. But every single time I pluck one of these, check this out. This is just a single feather here. Look at this. Everyone's a perfect bugger tail. You stack them, you've got an even dense, even more dense bugger tail right there. And the thing I love about it is this, since it's more fibrous than your normal marabou, moves like crazy. Um, I like this. Somebody asked, do streamers make me feel warm and fuzzy? Yes, absolutely. I mean, what, what's what's wrong with wanting to fish something that's going to get mercilessly ransacked when retrieved? I mean, I, I love that. that. I mean, I think the only thing that makes me more warm and fuzzy than, you know, just streamers and tying them in general is when the fish actually eats it. And then it's kind of a, there's the internal, you know, pain of, oh, God, that was a hard hit. But then there's also the warm and fuzzy of like, this is what I've been waiting for. And so there, there, there's a balance. But check out the Spay Soft Tackle Chickaboo. Comes in a number of colors. You can also get it in Natural Grizzly. Um, and that's one of the things that's kind of one that I keep in my back pocket that, you know, I, I like talking about materials that aren't widely known um, because it does offer up, you know, a lot of solutions to problems that we face in fly tying. This, you've got a material that literally, if you take one of the actual soft hackle feathers, this stuff is so fibrous that it literally looks like craft fur. And I know you can't really see that all that well on camera, but it literally, when you stack this together, it can actually be subbed for craft fur. So you can take what is a synthetic fiber and take now a natural fiber and put it in its place. It takes movement to another level entirely and you're using a fiber that's, you know, or a feather rather that's already found in nature. So we also get questions about Coq de Leon. What is CDL, Coq de Leon? Um, it's actually a chicken that comes from Spain. So the thing that's cool about this is, uh, here's what I mentioned, saddle feathers that hang and sag under their own weight. I love this, check this out. Look at the pink ones here. Look at this, if I turn them in reverse, they literally will fold totally double and, and fold over on themselves. It's awesome to have a feather that is that limber for your streamer tying. If you're going to do anything that's extended uh, out the end of the fly, I think that's one of the absolute best you can use of something that will actually move and still stay, you know, still has the shape and can, keeps the consistency in the shape. But when it comes time and you actually strip the fly or you twitch it, the whole feather undulates as opposed to just a quiver. I like something that will really, really move. Um, somebody says, I don't have feathers, feather problems. I have a feather solution. And that could very much be true. I mean, pick your poison, 
So it, it's, it, and that's, that's the best part. We, we carry a lot of tying materials in the fly shop. Uh, any patterns do I use black laced hen? Absolutely. Um, even badger uh, feathers where they've got that dark center. I like that because it gives you that kind of core color and then the outer edge, or you can reverse it and use black lace and it gives you more of that speckling when wound. Uh, I love that. And I also use black lace on uh, a lot of my bass bugs as well. I think that makes a really good classic looking hair bug. Uh, we did have another question here about um, distance between the front and back hook when tying articulated. How does that affect the fly's action? You know, what, it, what does that do to it? So the distance is something I think that more than action, if you articulate a fly, yes, it will move. But think about it, if you've got a lot of beads or something or a shank in between with nothing on it, then you basically have, looks almost like a dog bone. You got a puff of material here, puff of material there, and nothing in the middle. Um, so that's not great. You want the articulation to serve the fly. Don't get carried overboard where you articulate something where it almost looks like you got two flies spaced out. Try to do it where there's continuity. And a lot of that comes into play with what material you're using. If you're using a craft fur, then you have to keep them a little closer together. If you're using something like, you know, yak or something that's really, really long, like a, any sort of, uh, you know, like a sheep or a streamer hair, Icelandic sheep, stuff like that, that can be a really long material. You can articulate a fly a very far distance apart and still gain movement out of both sections of the fly. Uh, do keep in mind that the tendency of, of a fly to foul will typically increase as you kind of get them a little further apart in those longer materials. Um, it depends on how stiff that articulation wire is in the center. If it's stiffer, your odds of fouling are less. If it's more limber, your odds of fouling are obviously a lot higher. Um, one thing I would mention in, a, in an articulated fly, and uh, Charlie did a great job of that, you see just the spacing where that front section kind of cones over the other. That way that little back tail's doing everything it needs to do while the front really guides the fly and sets the tone for the party going on in the back. And that's the whole idea of having, and you saw when he kind of put the resin on the front side of the head, that does a lot for a fly because it gives it that bulky head that wants to push water and causes it to careen in different angles uh, when you strip or twitch it. And the back is simply along for the ride, simply twitching and flipping and doing everything it's supposed to do. And notice he had that uh, a flared material on the back as well that equally helps it push water. Um, I love that sort of stuff. I love the use of duck on that fly, that flank there. I think that's a very, very good use to actually palmer it instead of just tying it in as a, uh, you know, a topper or something like that on the fly. I love it when it's palmered. It gives such a great look on a fly. Um, so nonetheless, when you look at spacing, you know, experiment with, with it, have fun with it. But at the same time, it has its limits. Don't, don't go nuts to the point where it doesn't serve a purpose. If it serves a purpose in fly tying, do it. Solve a problem. If you're just doing it to see if you can get away with it, I mean, that's good for like one try. But uh, if it serves a purpose and solves a problem, that, then you got a dog that'll hunt. And that's something that any good fly designer is trying to do is find a problem, solve it using whatever materials are at his or her dispense, like, you know, right there at their fingertips where you can do that and, and go, for that, go for the solution based on the materials and even the structure of the fly. And so that's something to talk about. Let's talk about food groups a little bit. When does a streamer not become a streamer? And that, that's, and I, I would even, I'll, I'll ask for opinions on this. Cause I mean, I live in bass country. I'm by, by no means a dry fly purist. Um, do I love fishing dry flies? Absolutely. Would I love to watch bass? sip a size 20 Griffiths gnat? Oh no, no. My, my version of a bass eating a Griffiths gnat is something that's going to be that long and make a lot of noise. But when does a streamer become something else? You know, I mean, dry flies, when is it a true dry fly? When is it a terrestrial? You know, obviously we know the categor categorization of when the insect lives on land and falls in the water, but do we lump it into dry flies or is it still just its own thing in its own category? Well, with streamers, I think that's something that's really interesting because, I mean, we're not just talking about bait fish here. I think most people categorize streamers as bait fish, but, you know, we have leeches, we have creature baits, we've got crayfish, we've got all sorts of stuff that, you know, live subsurface. I mean, my gosh, if you ever watch a swimming mayfly nymph, like a, an Isonychia, for instance, it's a slate winged drake nymph. If you look at one of those, they swim as fast as a small minnow, but we still fish it as a nymph. We don't fish it as a streamer. So there, there's a lot of things that kind of get interesting, and, I, and I'll let you kind of muddle that in your own minds. But 
you know, when you think about streamer patterns, I'll hold up a few. All these are signature patterns. I told Uncle I wouldn't show anything that isn't in the catalog. But, you know, nonetheless, and by the way, CNF's whip finisher, these things are expensive. But the coolest thing about it is they've got a magnet in the bottom of them. And I absolutely love that because it's really easy to hold flies up and not stick yourself and show things. So I know this probably isn't going to appear perfectly well on camera, but, you know, little bait fish patterns. This is a BC streamer, another Umqua signature fly of mine. And this little thing imitates just a super small, like, shiner pattern. Or it can even be a shad in open water for a lake, uh, you know, anything like that. But, I mean, I catch trout on this like crazy. And it's weighted enough and it's tied jig style that you can actually Euro, you know, Euro nymph with the streamer. And it's really cool to have that. Um, one of my top level producers for, you know, crystal clear water, and it's more impressionistic, not that real realistic pattern. Uh, the thing that I would mention about this is like, when bait fish streamers, you have to think it's not just these big, gaudy, you know, giant flies that you're trying to move a lot of water with. Sometimes you're just trying to look like the smallest thing in the food chain that you're wanting to catch quantity and match the hatch. If you don't have bait fish this long in play, and all the bait fish in the fishery are about this long based on life cycle or time of year or whatever's running up river, anything like that. This is something to consider is not every streamer is going to be this massive, long, giant piece of meat. There's another side of streamer fishing as well that does come into play here. And that is the actual replication side, a lot like matching the hatch in the dry fly world. Uh, don't rule out your small bait fish. Uh, th those definitely come in handy. You know, juvenile crayfish, this is another one that I love fishing around here, the Rio Bandito. I know it's a small fly on camera, but it's just a very, very small juvenile baitfish pattern. And you can nymph it, you can jig it, you can strip it, you can twitch it, you can do whatever you want to with this thing. I mean, you just find a way that it makes you happy. Like, whatever makes you feel good fishing this fly, do that, and it'll catch fish for you. I mean, that's the thing that I love about it is even though it's technically a streamer fly, because it's a juvenile crayfish and we're stripping or twitching the fly to retrieve it, you know, it's not just a bait fish food group. There's also so many other, uh, you know, organisms that fall into that streamer category. And I think that's something that we really miss a lot when we're looking at streamers. We're solely concentrated and fixated on bait fish and larger bait fish. And a lot of times we miss the fact that there's more, you know, pint size, bite size varieties out there that can match the hatch when fish get very discerning or very picky in clear water or pressured. And uh, having some of those little bitty bait fish patterns can really come in handy, as well as juvenile crayfish patterns. They have their merit, um, especially in pressured water. Now, is that a streamer? Is something like this actually a streamer? I mean, that's a massive, you know, almost like it's like a bass jig, which essentially is what it is. This is the chuck wagon. This is one that I made to basically replicate a bass jig. At what point does it just become a subsurface bass fly versus a streamer? The question remains, and I still don't know the answer. But it's tied like a streamer, and the fact that it's got, you know, lead eyes, and, you know, it's got a furl dubbing tail, and there's plenty of perfect rubber on it to do all that fancy dance and stuff that I told you about earlier in the presentation. But, you know, at what point are we swimming it? At what point are we crawling it? What point do we leave that classification? The, the question remains, and I'm not sure there is an answer. The main thing is this, when you fish them, it's all up to how you're matching the hatch, what problem you're trying to solve, and you are solving a problem, not just in the fly itself, but also in how you retrieve it. And so when you're thinking streamers, really do make sure that no matter how much you blur the lines on the fly categories or what is or what isn't, make sure that you're solving a problem in your retrieve, not just in your fly pattern, because a fly pattern's great, but I mean, how many trout fishermen will tell you this? They would rather have the wrong fly with the right drift, and they will catch more fish than the guy who has the spot on right fly and a cruddy drift. The same can be said for streamers. I'd rather have the wrong pattern with a kick butt retrieve. That's what I want. I want to sell that fly every second of that retrieve, and I will catch more fish than the guy who's dialed on his pattern but can't fish a fly to save his life. That's what I really want you to do is solve the problems, not just from the vice, not just from the fly bins themselves. Umqua sells an entire just catalog of streamers. There's a ton of just absolute fire patterns out there. But if you can't fish them, the fly is only so good. So make sure that you're experimenting with leader, leader arrangements. You're experimenting with lines different retrieves. One of the things we'll bring up as we introduce John Bond's Dragon 
is that he's got something in it when I quizzed him for kind of his his take on some of this. I loved what some of what he had to say that gets overlooked by even myself. You know, I mean, I fish streamers a lot. And I mean, we're in bass country. We do a lot of it. But he brought a perspective to it that I thought was really neat that, you know, when I thought about it, I was like, my gosh, I do that too. But I've never articulated that in such a sense to where, you know, I'd put it as a bullet point in a presentation. And I really appreciate that about discussing things with other fantastic world-class hires and, you know, they're, they're really good at what they do, and they put a lot of thought into the process. And it's what makes Umpqua so great as a company, is they sign so many people on that are fantastic fly designers. But it's not just, I tied this and threw it at them and said, please pick up my fly. The real great ones are the ones that thought a process through. And John did that with the dragon. I think this is really cool. So the, this fly is quite literally a bar fly. It was designed at the filling station in Bozeman, Montana. So it's literally designed at a bar. So it is a bar fly, which I thought was interesting. If you want to look at fly history, I think that's a, you know, I think many things uh, are thought up at bars and, uh, you know, fly designs are probably no exception to that. I find that my, my best ones typically come while I'm falling asleep and that or the kids get up in the middle of the night. And I'm going to bed. And I'm like, I wonder what happens if I put this feather on top of that feather and then something's born. So mine normally are late night sleep interruptions, but some get, you know, constructed at bars. John really wanted a fly that had a beefy profile that would push water, uh, still have more of that kind of juvenile trout or, you know, juvie whitefish type profile. And the thing that was interesting, and this is what I, and I love this, and I've got this in my notes too, that he prefers a sink tip line versus a full sink line. And I love fishing sink tips. I have no problem with that. I find myself fishing a lot more full sinks these days because they've actually come a long way in their castability. But John makes a really, really good point, And I love this. Talks about fishing a sink tip because you can make the cast from a walkway perspective or even a boat, and you can mend the running line. That way the fly continues to gain depth on a slack line presentation. Brilliant. I love that. I do it on the Colorado River here for bass, but like I've never really thought to articulate that in such a sense of that is a prime reason to use a sink tip line over a full sink. And the fact that you know, I mend my line a lot to set up a drift and, you know, even using sink tips, I'll do that, but I never really thought about it. And the fact of in a trout arena, you're looking at your, you've got a slack line presentation where that fly is at the mercy of the current, gaining depth quickly, sink tip, pulling it down, but the line is manageable from a running line standpoint. That's a brilliant way to fish a streamer. And then when the line comes tight, a lot of times you're there for the swing, which is awesome. And it's easy to track with a running line that's typically brighter colored and floating. Um, the other thing that he mentioned is on this fly, he does a strip, strip, pause, strip, strip, pause, kind of that two strips with a long pause to the point where the strips are, you know, anywhere from six inches to a foot. And he mentioned as short as three inches if he's doing real, you know, just kind of the ticks versus a strip. Um, but the pauses are long. He mentions like two to five seconds. Now, in a still water situation, that fly is obviously going to fall some. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but in moving water, you have to think about in that pause, that fly tumbles and it actually catches current. And the way that it's structured, it's going to have a lot of motion, even in the pause. Like I said, every really great streamer pattern typically going to have motion while the fly is at rest and not being manipulated by the angler. Um, and then once again, paramount, paramount, again, all these streamer patterns tonight, motion is key. Think about your materials. Think about that when you select your patterns. Um, and, and even if you find a streamer pattern that is a tried, tested, proven profile, but it doesn't move enough for you, tie the fly with a different material. Like if, if it integrates a lot of bucktail, is it there for structure or is it there for profile? There's got to be a reason to use every material. But that's the whole thing is like if I want motion, bucktail ain't going to do it for me most of the time unless it's tied in extremely long lengths. You know, little bitty short bits of bucktail aren't going to move much. They're great for profile and they're great for structure and even for helping build a body of a fly. Um, but they're not very mobile, uh, not, not much at all when compared to a lot of their synthetic counterparts or even, you know, natural feathers and things like that. Um, so think about that. When you, if you have a fly, you're like, man, I love the profile. I catch fish on this, but I'm having a hard time selling it when a fish is scrutinizing it. Think about that. Maybe change a material to or add something in the center of the fly you know, to where there's a core material that undulates and the outside still looks exactly the same for structure. So just a few things to think about. Um, 
But once again, in closing, I know we got to wrap, and then I'm going to kick off uh, John's tying, tying video here of all the stuff he's going to go through to tie this. It is lengthy, but it's a very involved fly, and I think it's well worth your time, uh, and especially a fly that you know is tried, tested, and proven. And John, thanks for joining in all the way from uh, overseas tonight. I'm, I appreciate that. And uh, hopefully I do, I do your fly a little bit of intro justice because it's a, it's a worthy pattern and, and worthy of everybody's box. Um, but in closing, make sure that you follow Umquaf and subscribe, stay with the program. There's gonna be a lot more uh, videos that come out like this. They're gonna have infinitely better hosts. And so uh, just, just uh, stay tuned for those. Um, and then if you'd like to get in touch with me, um, obviously uh, you can follow the shop and myself on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, and the shop name is Living Waters Fly Fishing. We're located right here in Central Texas. Happy to help anybody um, with whatever questions they have or if there's any sort of fly fishing needs. But I'm going to say this, and I say this in every presentation where I have to mention the shop, and that is, folks, support your local fly shop. I'm, I am totally fine with supporting fly shops out of your area. I think that's fine, but don't do it at the expense of your locals. If they've got something that we've got, buy it from them, for goodness sake, man. Keep the fly shops alive. This industry depends upon shops like this that literally breathe life into the industry, help answer your questions. I mean, they have free events. You're going to have guides that operate out of the shop. You're going to have fishing reports. All great shops have this stuff. And I know that there's a lot of shops now that it's getting harder to find fly tying stuff. And you see more people having to shop a little bit more abroad. But please give your local shops a chance before you call out. I want to see shops thrive all across this country. And uh, so please don't do business with us at the expense of your local shop. Please give them a shop first. And, and I think a lot of shop owners across the country would mirror that sentiment. And if they don't, then it's probably fairly short-sighted. I, I want you to really support your local fly fishing community because that's what makes this sport great is family. It's a fly fishing family. And when I go to fly shops, even though I own one, I spend a lot of money and I, I do because I know what they go through on a day-to-day -day basis to make that shop work. And man, I'll be honest, I'm asking for advice. I'm in their wheelhouse. Yeah, I, I've, I've been at this a while and guided a long time and you know, I fly fish most of my life, but I'm still learning. I mean, I, I don't have the corner on the market. I'm just some guy from Texas. And so for me, I really do encourage you when you go to local shops, ask them for info, glean that knowledge, support your local shops. And then when you do travel abroad, make sure that you do support the shops that do supply that info and that know-how that are the local specialists. They are the guys that literally have it dialed. And so I would encourage you as you, as you give your shops a chance, if they don't carry the materials you're looking for, there's a number of great shops. I know Charlie's shop is loaded to the gills with material too. And so do whatever you need to do, but don't do, don't, don't shop outside the area of your local shop if you haven't given them a chance to fill your order first. And so I know that's kind of a weird thing to say in closing, but I want this industry to thrive. I'm passionate about this sport. I'm passionate about this fly fishing family all across the world. And I want to see it thrive because this is a sport that I've literally given my life to. And I know so many fine, fine people that make a living in this industry and so many fine people that this is their passion and their hobby and what they love to do. They do it on their days off. They daydream about it when they're not doing it. And I mean, trust me, I was, I was a high schooler once tying flies in class. I did that. Uh, you'd never believe I made straight A's, but I tried to major in fishing in college and it didn't work. So I started a fly shop. I literally left college to do this. I do not recommend that as your life story, but it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work. And I'm so blessed to have met so many wonderful people in this sport. And so I wanted to thank you for joining us tonight on the Umqua live cast of the streamer class tonight. Thank you so much. And uh, if you need to hit us up as a shop, once again, Living Waters Fly Fishing right down here in the Lone Star State. Thank you all so much for spending time with us tonight. And uh, make sure you like, subscribe, follow everything Gump was doing. It is such an honor to work with such an incredible company with so many great tires across the world. And uh, I hope you learned something tonight about streamer fishing. Hopefully I did it some justice. And uh, we are going to launch John Bond's Dragon tonight. And it's gonna be a lengthy tie, but it's well worth your time. And uh, we're gonna close on a high note with a fly that really will move you some fish and hopefully, uh, hopefully catch your fish of a lifetime. If you're gonna do it, a streamer is a good way to do it. 
Thank you all so much for watching. It's been a pleasure hosting tonight, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you all again. Here is John Bond's Dragon. Hello, thanks for tuning in to another one of Umqua's signature tying sessions. My name is John Bond, and we are clocking into you just below the Arctic Circle here at our fishing lodge in Norway. We're going to be tying up a few of my signature streamer patterns, this one here being the dragon, formerly known as the Beefcake, back in 2012 when I invented it, and named it after Bruce Lee because this fly kicks ass. So... We're going to be going through a few of the different materials I use to create this fly and walking you through it step by step so you can do it yourself. Thanks for tuning in and let's rock and roll. To start this off, we'll talk about the hooks a little bit. To start off, I'm going to be using a size 6 stinger hook for the tail and a size 2 for the head and upper body. Stingers just seem to keep the fish stuck to them a little bit better in my opinion, so I've been using those for many years and I can resharpen them over and over again if I get caught up on a rock or a log or something like that so they... They've always treated me well. Other materials we're going to be using. Cream Marabou from Nature Spirit. And some UV Polar Chenille Silver. And some sand colored Arctic Fox on a wire brush. Now you can use... A variety of different fox fur you can also tie in a dubbing loop for the head or even just stack some in but just user friendly ease of use and good combination of uv and the right proportions of arctic fox i love these brushes and that's really user friendly for you at home so we'll be going with some 210 denier danville thread and this six number six Stinger hook. And we'll start right at the top here. Work our way all the way to the bottom, right before the curve of the hook. And I'll just cover that hook real well with that thread all the way through, build up a good base so nothing slips. And I'll leave the thread just hanging there while I pick out a couple nice plumes of marabou. And for the tail, I like to use these little pieces that are more spread out and sparse. I usually use two pieces of this marabou for the tail to kind of stack it on top of each other and give it more body, more flow, more action. And I like these pieces because they, they almost look like a fish tail anyway at the very end. The, these tips just look good, especially when they get wet. And they're also a little bit stiffer, so they... They swim good. So I'll take this marabou and I'll just slide it, slide my fingers all the way up to the tip, pinch the tip at a distance, maybe a little bit longer than what I'm going to use, and then place it just at the very top of the curve of the shank on that hook. And my placement, so, you know, I've got... Everyone's got their own little techniques when they tie their flies and, you know, points points of interest or points to remember how far I use for different marabou or different sizes of marabou on certain flies. So I go just beyond my little bump here on my vise, maybe, you know, quarter to a half and an inch. It's better to have the tail a little bit longer so it gets more action than too short and then it just kind of floats through the, the water current like a dart instead of having some motion to it. So I place that piece of marabou just at the top of the curve there. Then I tie it in. My first couple wraps are a little bit loose because I like to kind of wiggle it and spread it around that hook so it 
kind of forms around that that curve and then I give it a couple heavy cranks a couple tight wraps just to secure it in place and none of this has to be too pretty just kind of crank it down make sure it's not going to go anywhere I always save the ends of my the other ends of my marabou because you never know what they can be used for they always come in handy for something so I'll come in and with the, these tails I usually add two pieces you can add more but proportions are really the key to tying flies you don't want to have too much you don't want to have too little so I'll tie I'll tie in two pieces and I'll line up the tips of the feathers together and then pinch with my other hand and spread it just a little bit around that hook and as I said before a couple light wraps make sure everything's where you want it to be pull back on it and then give it some cranks and I like using this 210 denier thread because I can really wrench on it make sure everything is secure as possible save that piece for later and tie in the rest of this so it's not flapping around and getting in my way for the next step so once we're there we've got our our two pieces of marabou looking good off the tail and I'll take a maybe about a little over an inch inch and a half and you can go a little bit more a little bit less it depends on how much of this UV polish nail you want to you want to use but it you know it also adds a little bulk to the body not only just flash it adds some substance to the body to make it more of a consistent profile when it's wet so I'll take the end tie it into the, the back of the hook just the very tip there give it a couple really tight wraps it doesn't take much to keep that in place then I'll work the thread all the way back up to the to just behind the eye then making sure it's straight and not twisted because this UV polar chenille can twist on you make sure it's not twisted give a good sturdy pinch to the very end of it and I like to use these rotary vices from Regal so I just kind of give it a twist with my rotary vise and you can make it as tight or as, as spread out as you want to wrap that puppy all the way up to the top the tighter it is the more bulk they'll be then I while securing it with some pressure on my right finger I'll pull back all the material with my left and there's always a little bit that stays straggled in the front but no big deal give it some wraps secure it in then come back up and pull everything back while tying in the rest of what you got and I usually tie it back you know tie it back you know quarter of an inch back because I'm going to be placing another piece of marabou right on top of this and as I said none of this has to look too pretty just keep it consistent keep it classy and then before I was talking about the different types of marabou that you get in a package right here is a good a good explanation of the differences this kind of is more spread out and the tip of it has very strong fibers so it almost it almost looks like a tail when you're looking at it from from just straight out of the package and this piece is a little more fluffy it just feels like it has like a little more down to it a little more puff and I like to use these pieces for the bellies and the backs of these dragons because it just you know one piece you, like one piece of the marabou seems to go further than than those more spread out pieces that we were using for the tail so I'll take this tip and I put it at the pretty much right at the eye of the hook and I want to make sure that it covers just about just past where all that UV chenille goes you know I like my flies flashy but not too flashy so I kind of disguise it a little bit with these pieces of marabou so I pop it in there right below the uh, eye of the hook and then with my left hand I spread it just around 
the hook shank. And then I tie it in. Again, my first couple wraps are a little loose. Just want to make sure it's spread around that hook nice. Still holding it in place. And then I'll give it a couple more heavy duty wraps with that thread. And you know, while you're in this process and you're, you might be new to it or you might not be as confident in it, you just check to make sure you're not too close to that eye. It doesn't really matter. You can't be too, I mean, you don't want to be in the middle of the hook, but you don't want to be right, right behind the eye because then you can't get your connective material to make it articulated. It's hard to get it into that eye at that point. So from there, I just cut it, save that piece of marabou, pull everything back with my left hand, and then work my way forward, securing everything else down and making it look smooth and flush. Then I'll flip it over, give it a couple whip finishes, either three or four, whatever you like. And I usually do it twice just because I like to really ensure that my flies stay together 100%. There won't be any problems with it. There, try to build them, build them to last as long as they can. So a couple whip finishes and then there we go. This is the tail of the dragon, the dragon tail. Most of the time I'll take a little bit of this uh, zap a gap and just hit it real quick. But I think this one's secure enough and we're gonna go straight to tying it so I won't have enough time to let that glue heal. So onto the head of the fly using a size two stinger hook. So this is a little bit bigger. Lately, since I moved over here to Norway, I'm not fishing as much of these big size two hooks. The fish don't seem to like really big streamers as much as they did back on the Yellowstone. So these size two hooks, I haven't been using as much. I've been, I've been knocking it down to a size four and a size six for a tail. So size four for the head size two for the tail instead of this size, or size six for the tail instead of this size two. And, you know, this this is kind of, this is the way I first started tying them. This is the way that Umqua ties them with these bigger size two hooks. And they just, you know, they, they're sturdy and they're, they're as, I, as I build my flies, the same as I build my flies, I build them to last. And this, these hooks, you can just resharpen over and over again. If you get caught on a log or a rock, you can just take a file to it and get it sharp again in just a matter of seconds. So, same as before, just wrap that thread, start from behind the eye, work your way all the way down to just before the curve, the hook. And you know, sometimes I'll cut off that extra little piece, but most of the time I can just tie it in, I mean, little extra thread doesn't doesn't hurt anybody and I mean everyone has their own preference for putting a certain amount of thread on a hook I like to not see any chrome I like to cover that hook with enough thread that it's not gonna nothing's gonna go anywhere once once you put it on there it's gonna stick to it and so with these dumbbell eyes before we start putting these on, I like to build up a little middle section for where I place them, just so there's a little bit more for them to grab onto so they don't rotate or spin on the hook. And, you know, some people will put the, the eyes of the hook right behind the eye. I like to stick them, you know, maybe a half an inch, half an inch behind. You know, a little more than a quarter, a little less than a half just so I can build up the head on the rest of that hook with that Arctic Fox. And I tend to fish a lot of my hooks up so the eyes will be face down just so I don't get caught up on the bottom as much. I like to swing these flies just as much as I like to strip them so it adds a little more versatility and not losing as many of these big flies as much. So, and. You know, as I said, I like to really reinforce all of my material on this fly. So it's, once you place it, you set it and forget it. It's not going to move. 
Some people do just figure eights the whole way. I do multiple wraps in a figure eight form so these eyes don't twist. I don't glue them in or anything like that. Less glue the better, in my opinion. So I just really, you know, make sure they're they're nice, they're nice and in there. And it's hard to get these eyes to always sit perfectly. One of them leans a little to the right or to the left always. It's hard to get them perfectly flush. So I build up a good amount of thread on there just to make sure they're not going anyplace. Then work that thread all the way back to the curve of the hook. And we'll get the tail ready with our articulation connector and the beads. Some people like to use like uh, metal wire or even like thick mono to connect a fly for articulation. I really like to use this 80 pound uh, braided backing. The first time I ever tied this fly, I didn't have any articulation material at the bar when I was bartending, just messing around, figuring stuff out and kind of trying different things. So I used some 20 pound backing that I had and the next day I went and fished the fly and it had an amazing, amazing movement under the water. It wasn't just locked into going back and forth. It had more of a serpent feel, more of an actual fishy feel. So I've been using this ever since and this 80 pound backing is extremely, extremely strong, very durable. I've had people fish these flies for striped bass that get over 30 pounds and never have had a problem on it. Earlier this year, I caught a 20 pound pike on a black version of this fly and it held up great. No problems with it at all. The only problem is sometimes getting this, this material through the eye of the hook. So I slightly wet it down and put it right through the center of that puppy. That one gave me no issues at all. So, well, putting the beads on these, I kind of put them in tandem. So you're not trying to get two pieces of this thread through one, one of the little holes of the beads. So you do it one at a time. And with this particular fly, <clears throat> we're going to be using three separate beads. One of these cream miracle beads kind of Oh, they call them 3D beads, but you can find them all over the place, and they're sometimes called 3D beads or miracle beads. So get your thread dialed in, your backing, or your connective, t uh, connective material, whatever you use, and thread those puppies in. So the funny thing about these skulls that I use I was shopping at a Joanne's Fabrics back in Bozeman, Montana in 2012. And I was just looking for, for some good beads. And I came across these and they're made of um, sometimes pewter, sometimes just, you know, copper or whatever. These are, they add a little bit of weight, but they're also just, you know, at, at the beginning when I first started doing it, it was just more of a, a way to pimp my ride and make it make the fly kind of my own so if anybody bought my flies or were using my flies they know where they came from and they add a little bit of extra weight because as i was saying earlier these flies are a little more buoyant with all that fox fur and marabou so they don't sink as fast as others so this just adds a little bit more weight it adds a little bit of sound when they click together and it helps the whole fly sink at a better speed than just up to down the whole thing kind of sinks helps the body get down there and sometimes you know i've got a bunch of different colors of these 3d beads sometimes i'll use a a cream or a gray one and then add a little red for a little wounded bait fish glow in the belly there and then after i get all my beads on just like so i will check i'll pull the beads forward a little bit and make sure that this backing isn't spun on itself because that will make the fly twist a little bit while you're stripping it or fishing it. So I make sure that the backing 
is pretty flush. And you should do that with your metal metal wire or anything that you really use for a for a backing connector or a uh, articulated connector. So I put that in right at the right at the end of the curve of the hook, right at the beginning of the curve of the hook there, and then I figure out my spacing. It's usually like in between a quarter and a half an inch away that I want to tie it in. And that gives this a little bit of play. I mean, I've only had had a hook can, like hook into this backing material like once or twice out of almost 10 years of fishing these. So it's never, never really been a big problem. So I'll, I'll tie it in loose, just to get everything dialed in and make sure that that, that articulation material is just right on that curve because you don't want it to be way down here so it's right behind the hook then it'll wrap around the front hook more often than not i want to put that that connective material right here on the back and again with that 210 denier i really wrench down on it i crank down on this super hard so there's never ever a worry about a slip and other things you can do with either metal mono or this backing material is you can take one end of it separate the two pieces and tie one in at a time once you get to the end of it just like that and then I'll force that push that back over and tie that in so there's even less likelihood of anything slipping or popping loose and I'm not too shy with my thread I don't mind giving it a few extra wraps just to make sure everything's gonna stay nice and secure so we've got the tail hook locked in Back hook facing up as well, top hook facing up, and grab some more of that UV polar chenille silver, and you can use anything you like. Sometimes I, I mix and match, sometimes I just go straight copper because I love this copper UV polar chenille, but the way that I've made these for the public and sold them at a few different fly shops, I've always gone just, you know, Pretty solid colors and consistent colors and I keep the uh, color combos to myself secret stash so just grab the tip of that UV polar chenille put it right there at the very back and crank it in just wrap that sucker all the way in then I'll bring my thread all the way up from from the back to the, the front of the eyes get a hold of that UV polar chenille Yet again, making sure it's not twisted or there's any problems with it. You'll want to wrap it in when it's all twisted up. You can kind of pull some of that material back if it's messing with you. And then I'll just use this rotary vise to spin it on. And as I said before, you can use more or less depending on how bulky you want this fly to look. So place it in, pull as much of it back as I can. And give it a couple wraps just to, just to secure it. Then I'll come over and pull everything back real well. And crank down on it just to make sure everything's locked and loaded. Leaving it, again, like another little more than a quarter inch back behind the eyes. Because you're going to place a couple pieces of marabou top and bottom. Okay. UV polar chenille is locked in. Now to pick a couple good pieces of marabou to stick in there. And I'll usually take two pieces for the underbelly just because most of the time that's what the fish are seeing. They're looking up. They want to see that white belly. And sometimes I do color combos with these streamers. I'll do you know, a piece of cream marabou and another piece of yellow on top of it so they kind of blend well. But for the most part, these solid colors I've never had any problem with and they seem to come out pretty good. The fish don't mind it. So I'll place that just past the UV polar chenille and just at the tip of the tail hook so they blend together. I don't want to have it too long. So, you know, if the marabou's too long, it can move 
a little separately from the from the fly when you're swimming it. So I like to have it just covering that middle body, middle section there. That's a little too long. The thing that I've noticed with tying flies, the most important thing is proportions. You got to have the right proportions. If you're using too much or too little, it just doesn't work. So got, got the right amount, the right length. And again, I use my, my fingers to kind of curl it around the hook before I tie it in. Then I tie it in a couple, three wraps, but pretty loose. And just make sure if I need to, I can shimmy it around that hook. And then I'll give it a couple cranks just to lock it in nice and strong. Trim that puppy, save it for later. Take another piece. Most of the time I just do two. Two on the belly and maybe one on the head. The hook or the eyes are, are pointed down anyway, so the belly's gonna sink. But I do like to have this fly fairly buoyant, so if I swing it, it kind of hovers in the zone and doesn't go straight to the bottom. It gives me the opportunity to play the from the bank down to the bottom without it just sinking straight away. And I can play a couple different levels of depth, a couple, a couple different angles to swing it at. So there's my two pieces of marabou on the belly. Just crank that in real good. Pull all that excess marabou back. Now we're locked in. And then for the, uh, the top piece on the back, I'm picking this piece. It's a little bit thicker than, than the two I used for the belly, but still not thick thick as using two pieces. So kind of pinch that, figure out the way I want it to lay, get my placement, pull the tail back so I can kind of judge the placement and make sure that the tips of the marabou are just a little bit past the eye of the, the back hook. Spread it out over that hook again around the back using my fingertips right behind the eye and I crank it in. Sometimes I need to use two pieces of marabou if I'm if I'm cranking out a couple dozen flies a day. I need to. I don't want to waste too much time picking out the the right pieces for for each one. And I, I have two that look good, or just one that looks good. I'll just stick with one piece, and it's no problem. I'll give that a couple more cranks, not being shy with the thread. Then we'll move over to the flash that I use the, for the lateral line, the lateral flash. And I use, I use this stuff called mirror crinkle flash. And you can use, you can use anything that you like. I mean, it all works, but I really like this stuff because it has almost like a scale, a scaly texture to it. And the, it just, it catches the fisherman more than the fish. I think it, it doesn't really matter what kind of flash you use, but I really like this stuff. So, and I'll take, I'll pull out one strand and I'll cut it in half and use two, one on, two on each side. So there'll be four in total. And this stuff we're using is a uh, mirror crinkle flash pink, but it has almost like a, a blue, purple, pink look to it. So it, it kind of looks like the side of a white fish when you get up close to them. So I'll curl that, double it over, cut it once, then I have two pieces. I'll take the two pieces that are approximately the same length, kind of bring them together, and hold them similar to that with my fingers. And I'll come in underneath the eye, hooks facing up, right behind the eye, <clears throat> right in front of the eye, pull them back behind the eye, and give it you know, two, two or three wraps, whatever, but you want to you wanna tie it in pretty loose. So you have the ability, if they're not flush, you can kind of move them up or down to get them to be at the right length, equal length on each side. Then I pull them down so they're facing sideways on the side of the hook. 
then they're good to go. Pull, pull everything back and just give it a couple secure wraps. Now, we're, now this fly is starting to take shape and there's really only a couple more pieces to the puzzle that we have to work in. So I used to do a lot of dubbing loops with fox fur and it can be kind of a pain in the ass and a little more time consuming than buying these fox fur brushes. And there's a variety of companies that use them. Go to your local fly shop, look at a hairline and you'll find what you're looking for. And these are really good because they're thin, they're not too bulky. I've definitely gone through the trial and error phase using too much or too little. And when it comes to this Arctic Fox, it seems like less is more. So I take a whole brush and I cut it in half. And that's what this is. This is a half of a brush and it just seems to work perfectly. Sometimes I might need a little bit more, but at the very end, I usually take a pinch and stack some in just at the tip of the nose to make everything look fine and dandy. Okay, so I take the end of this Arctic Fox brush and I, you know, the hooks are going to be swimming up on this fly. So I flip it over, I go to the underside, under its belly, under its neck, and I tie it in right behind the eyes. And again, I crank this puppy in. I really set this material in strong, give it a couple really heavy duty cranks. And then I bring it up to the nose just to double secure that this thing doesn't slide or move or anything. And then I'll even do a wrap diagonally around the eyes to make sure I, I over set my material purposely just so no one can complain and there's no problems. I snipped a little piece of metal off there with a shitty pair of scissors or a not so desirable pair of scissors. And then that metal wire, the end of that metal wire can stick up and cause problems. If I wasn't to trim it and then push it down, it might break my thread as I wrap it. So I kind of use my thumbnail to push it down and make sure it's even. And then I do some light wraps around the end of that piece of metal. And then I kind of just cover it up real quick. Bringing my thread all the way up to the right behind the eye of the hook. I get a hold of this Arctic Fox, Fox brush just with the tips of my fingers. I pinch it pretty tight. And then I start to pull this material backwards. Wrapping it away from me, <clears throat> away from me on this hook, right, right in front of that marabou, making sure all the materials pushed back. And as I start to wrap it away from me, I use my fingers to curl the rest of that Arctic fox backwards. You don't want to wrap all the Arctic fox over it in a big pile and not have it have it do its job. So the whole time while I'm wrapping, I'm using my fingers. To manipulate that arctic fox fur backwards and so we've already done almost two wraps all the way around and for the most part i do about two to two and a half wraps all the way around just behind the eyes there doesn't need to be much material right behind the eyes so once once i do those two nice wraps keeping tension the whole time on it because you want it to be tight you don't want it to move around after you, you start fishing it I bring it and I put it in between the eyes at a at a diagonal angle, pulling that material back, pinching, using pressure, and I bring it right in front of the eyes and continue wrapping it while manipulating that material backwards. This can be a pain in the neck when you're first starting to do it, but once you kind of get the hang of it, it's not too bad. Sometimes in the middle of wrapping this fly like this one's doing the material might get knotted together kind of junked up so i'll take this bobbin or bobkin sorry and i'll just kind of pluck everything out making it look good get all that straightened out all right and then i'll use my fingers to kind of comb everything back and again 
continue manipulating that fox fur back on that brush and wrapping away from you. And, you know, I'll stack, I'll do like two or three wraps, maybe one twist, so it's wrapped three times. Then I'll pinch it down, I'll, I'll pick it out again, just because it a little bit got a little chunked up right there. Pick it out as much as you want. It doesn't have to be too much. You're going to do it again at the end. Push everything back with your fingers. Make it all look good. All right, folks, had some technical difficulties. Had to switch out the battery real quick. But all I did was make one final wrap with the Arctic Fox. Trim off the remaining piece of this uh, boxy brush. And there was a little piece of metal sticking up that I pushed down with my thumb because if you leave that hanging up and continue to wrap, it could cut the thread and give you a complete cluster of problems. So this is pretty much that one half of the uh, Foxy brush, two wraps or two and a half wraps behind the eyes, and then about two wraps in front of the eyes. And that adds a pretty, um, pretty good bulky beefy head to it, but it's just not bulky enough for what I usually tend to like. After you fish it once or twice, the fur, the fox hair gets kind of dulled down and pushed down. So I will take the remaining pieces of Arctic Fox and I'll just straight pinch it off that brush. Pinch it and then I will kind of manipulate it into a nice last little chunk. And that chunk I will, I will take and pull all the excess out, kind of brush it with my fingers and make it look nice and flush. And I'll take that and I'll lay it right in between the eyes on the top of the fly. And I only use the very tip of the fox fur. You don't have to use all of it. And the lower down you go, the bulkier it gets anyway. So. I like to use the tip of it and I'll spread it out and comb it with my fingers, lay it down right on the tip of that fly, securing it with my fingers, giving it a couple loose thre uh, thread wraps, move it around with the tip of my thumb and then really secure it down. Now that adds a little extra bulk just to the front of the front of the fly. and I'll snip it down. Another reason why I do this is because I designed this fly to really push water. I used to fish mainly on the Yellowstone River and that river can be two feet of visibility or two inches of visibility depending on what time of year you're fishing and what the clarity is doing. So the fish aren't always hunting by sight but by feel using their spidey sense to kind of distinguish where the where the bait fish are and what's moving moving past them so i i pinched off a little bit and put some on the very top now for the bottom you know and just wrapping it wrapping that arctic fox once or twice in front of the eyes still makes it somewhat sparse so it's not as bulky as you want like you can almost see through the back or the bottom part here so it's it, it kind of looks like uh it's semi-balding. So taking that extra clump and just placing it on the top and bottom really give it that extra beef you're looking for. So I'll take just the tip, just the tips. I'm not using this back end that's really thick. Just the tips to kind of cover up any problems. And I'll secure it with my fingers before I tie it in. And then a couple loose wraps. Kind of angling the tip of the bobbin back towards the eyes so it catches everything and then as i said it's loose so i can still manipulate it with my thumb a little bit and i'll curve it around and flatten it out so it's not in one big pile and then i'll really wrench it down a few times now that's looking good i'll take my handy scissors here and snip it down as close as i can pulling everything back. And this also gives it a really fishy look. You know, and it's not, you know, I, I wrapped that Arctic Fox in a circle, 
but then stacking it makes it more wide top to bottom, making it look more like a white fish or a bait fish. And you can do it different ways to make it look a little bit more like a sculpin or use less material to make it kind of a, a thinner profile. I tie these in a variety of different profiles depending on how much water I'm looking to push and how much movement I want this to have under the water for the fish to feel. So that's, we're pretty much at the end here. So I'll take, I'll, I'll take my, fuck, I can't remember what this is called. Whip, whip finisher. Okay, so we can cut that out. So here we are at the very end of the fly. This is looking good, and I'll just take take my whip finisher and just do a couple finishing knots. Just whip out a few just to keep everything secured, locked in, and loaded. Three there, and then another three. You can't go wrong doing a couple extra, it's no big deal. Cinch it down, pull it tight, take the scissors, cut it tight. And then this is kind of this is kind of the final process I've I've been doing the last couple years with this just to kind of clean up that nose, add a little extra flare, a little extra color to it. I'll take some Zappa Gap, some glue, and I'll take some UV ice dub tan. Just a little pinch, a little dab will do ya. And I make a little dreadlock. I just spin it in my fingers, no big deal. It doesn't have to look pretty. You don't wanna use too much, less is more. And we're just gonna be tying this in around the, eye, around the nose, kinda of bulk it up and to pretty it up a little bit. But either way, you can use it or lose it. It's still gonna work. Fly is still deadly effective with or without it. I'll take my bobkin and just spread it, spread that around, make sure I hit all the surfaces. And I, I glue this anyway just to secure everything at the end, even if I wasn't using that UV ice tub. So we're good to go there. I take my little dreadlock and I'll just wrap it a few times, pulling off any excess I don't need. It doesn't have to look pretty. And then what I do is I take my fingers while pushing back towards the eyes, I just spin a few times. And that secures it to that glue and also pushes it back away from the eye of the hook so there's no material getting in your way of putting your tippet on. And that glue chemically bonds to that ice stub, locks everything in. And if there's any problem at the end, like a little piece that you don't want, there's usually a little leftover glue on my bobkin that I can kind of just brush any pieces that are hanging, hanging low off. And then again, I'll just give it a quick spin. The final process to this fly is taking those barbs and just laying them flat. Get those barbs out of the way. Knock those barbs off. Then I'll pull everything back straight, try not to hook myself, and just see how that UV mirror flash, or sorry, the, the mirror crinkle flash is sitting. I'll get rid of all that marabou, push it over, pull everything nice and tight, and just make sure my 
mirror crinkle flash is all sitting pretty even. And I'll just trim it even because I'm a stickler. This is a bulky, buoyant fly, but once it gets wet, it lays down. At first, you might feel like it's casting a wet sock, but once you, once you put some time into fishing it, you realize that it ain't that bad. And I designed this fly not to strip it a ton, but to swing it, let the current take it, and it gives it such a natural serpent movement it's not just locked into doing this or that the tail moves like a fish or like a water snake so there you have it folks the cream dragon original 